necessary. It was time that he was married, anyway, and he was fully aware that if Freddie Drummond didn't get married, Bill Tots assuredly would, and the complications were too awful to contemplate. And so, enters Catherine Van Voorst. She was a college woman herself, and her father, the one wealthy member of the faculty, was the head of the philosophy department as well. It would be a wise marriage from every standpoint, Freddie Drummond concluded when the engagement was consummated and announced. In appearance cold and reserved, aristocratic and wholesomely conservative, Catherine Van Voorst, though warm in her way, possessed an inhibition equal to Drummond's. All seemed well with him, but Freddie Drummond could not quite shake off the call of the underworld, the lure of the free and open, of the unhampered, irresponsible life south of the slot. As the time of his marriage approached, he felt that he had indeed sowed wild oats, and he felt, moreover, what a good thing it would be if he could have but one wild flea more, play the good fellow and the wastrel one last time, ere he settled down to grey lecture rooms and sober matrimony. And, further to tempt him, the very last chapter of labor tactics and strategy remained unwritten for lack of a trifle more of essential data which he had neglected to gather. So Freddie Drummond went down for the last time as Bill Tots, got his data, and, unfortunately, encountered Mary Condon. Once more installed in his study, it was not a pleasant thing to look back upon. It made his warning doubly imperative. Bill Tots had behaved abominably. Not only had he met Mary Condon at the Central Labor Council, but he had stopped at a chop house with her, on the way home, and treated her to oysters. And before they parted at her door, his arms had been about her, and he had kissed her on the lips and kissed her repeatedly. And her last words in his ear, words uttered softly with a catchy sob in the throat that was nothing more nor less than a love cry, were Bill dear, dear Bill. Freddie Drummond shuddered at the recollection. He saw the pit yawning for him. He was not by nature a polygamist, and he was appalled at the possibilities of the situation. It would have to be put an end to, and it would end in one only of two ways, either he must become wholly Bill Tots and be married to Mary Condon, or he must remain wholly Freddie Drummond and be married to Catherine Van Voorst. Otherwise, his conduct would be beneath contempt and horrible. In the several months that followed, San Francisco was torn with labor strife. The unions and the employers' associations had locked horns with a determination that looked as if they intended to settle the matter, one way or the other, for all time. But Freddie Drummond corrected proofs, lectured classes, and did not budge. He devoted himself to Catherine Van Voorst, and day by day found more to respect and admire in her a, even to love in her. The streetcar strike tempted him, but not so severely as he would have expected and the great meat strike came on and left him cold. The ghost of Bill Tots had been successfully laid, and Freddie Drummond with rejuvenescent zeal tackled a brochure, long planned, on the topic of diminishing returns. The wedding was two weeks off, when, one afternoon, in San Francisco, Catherine Van Voorst picked him up and whisked him away to see a boys' club, recently instituted by the settlement workers in whom she was interested. It was her brother's machine, but they were alone with the exception of the chauffeur. At the junction with Kearney Street, Market and Geary Streets intersect like the sides of a sharp angled letter V. They, in the auto, were coming down Market with the intention of negotiating the sharp apex and going up Geary. But they did not know what was coming down Geary, timed by fate to meet them at the apex. While aware from the papers that the meat strike was on and that it was an exceedingly bitter one, all thought of it at that moment was farthest from Freddie Drummond's mind. Was he not seated beside Catherine? And besides, he was carefully expositing to her his views on settlement work ease that Bill Toch Adventures had played a part in formulating. Coming down Gary Street were six meat wagons. Beside each scab driver sat a policeman. Front and rear and along each side of this procession, marched a protecting escort of 100 police. Behind the police rear guard, at a respectful distance, was an orderly but vociferous mob, several blocks in length, that congested the street from sidewalk to sidewalk. The Beef Trust was making an effort to supply the hotels, 
and, incidentally, to begin the breaking of the strike. The St. Francis had already been supplied, at a cost of many broken windows and broken heads, and the expedition was marching to the relief of the Palace Hotel. All unwitting, Drummond sat beside Catherine, talking settlement work, as the auto, honking methodically and dodging traffic, swung in a wide curve to get around the apex. A big coal wagon, loaded with lump coal and drawn by four huge horses, just debouching from Kearney Street as though to turn down market, blocked their way. The driver of the wagon seemed undecided, and the chauffeur, running slow but disregarding some shouted warning from the crossing policeman, swerved the auto to the left, violating the traffic rules, in order to pass in front of the wagon. At that moment Freddie Drummond discontinued his conversation. Nor did he resume it again, for the situation was developing with the rapidity of a transformation scene. He heard the roar of the mob at the rear, and caught a glimpse of the helmeted police and the lurching mead wagons. At the same moment, laying on his whip, and standing up to his task, the cold driver rushed horses and wagons squarely in front of the advancing procession, pulled the horses up sharply, and put on the big brake. Then he made his lines fast to the brake handle and sat down with the air of one who had stopped to stay. The auto had been brought to a stop, too, by his big panting leaders which had gemmed against it. Before the chauffeur could back clear, an old Irishman, driving a rickety express wagon and lashing his one horse to a gallop, had locked wheels with the auto. Drummond recognized both horse and wagon, for he had driven them often himself. The Irishman was Pat Morrissey. On the other side a brewery wagon was locking with a coal wagon, and an eastbound Kearney Street car, wildly clanging its gong, the motorman shouting defiance at the crossing policeman, was dashing forward to complete the blockade. And wagon after wagon was locking and blocking and adding to the confusion. The meat wagons halted. The police were trapped. The roar at the rear increased as the mob came on to the attack while the vanguard of the police charged the obstructing wagons. We're in for it, Drummond remarked coolly to Catherine. Yes, she nodded, with equal coolness. What savages they are! His admiration for her doubled on itself. She was indeed his sort. He would have been satisfied with her even if she had screamed, and clung to him, but this his was magnificent. She sat in that storm center as calmly as if it had been no more than a block of carriages at the opera. The police were struggling to clear a passage. The driver of the coal wagon, a big man in shirt sleeves, lighted a pipe and sat smoking. He glanced down complacently at a captain of police who was raving and cursing at him, and his only acknowledgement was a shrug of the shoulders. From the rear arose the rat rat tat of clubs on heads and a pandemonium of cursing yelling, and shouting. A violent accession of noise proclaimed that the mob had broken through and was dragging a scab from a wagon. The police captain reinforced from his vanguard, and the mob at the rear was repelled. Meanwhile, window after window in the high office building on the right had been opened, and the class-conscious clerks were raining a shower of office furniture down on the heads of police and scabs. Waste baskets, ink bottles, paper weights typewriters anything and everything that came to hand was filling the air. A policeman, under orders from his captain, clambered to the lofty seat of the coal wagon to arrest the driver. And the driver, rising leisurely and peacefully to meet him, suddenly crumpled him in his arms and threw him down on top of the captain. The driver was a young giant, and when he climbed on his load and poised a lump of coal in both hands, a policeman, who was just scaling the wagon from the side, let go and dropped back to earth. The captain ordered half a dozen of his men to take the wagon. The teamster, scrambling over the load from side to side, beat them down with huge lumps of coal. The crowd on the sidewalks and the teamsters on the locked wagons roared encouragement and their own delight. The motorman, smashing helmets with his controller bar, was beaten into insensibility and dragged from his platform. The captain of police, beside himself at the repulse of his men, led the next assault on the coal wagon. A score of police were swarming up the tall-sided fortress. But the teamster multiplied himself. 
At times there were six or eight policemen rolling on the pavement and under the wagon. Engaged in repulsing an attack on the rear end of his fortress, the teamster turned about to see the captain just in the act of stepping onto the seat from the front end. He was still in the air and in most unstable equilibrium, when the teamster hurled a 30-pound lump of coal. It caught the captain fairly on the chest, and he went over backward, striking on a wheeler's back, tumbling onto the ground, and jamming against the rear wheel of the auto. Catherine thought he was dead, but he picked himself up and charged back. She reached out her gloved hand and patted the flank of the snorting, quivering horse. But Drummond did not notice the action. He had eyes for nothing save the battle of the coal wagon, while somewhere in his complicated psychology, one Bill Tots was heaving and straining in an effort to come to life. Drummond believed in law and order and the maintenance of the established, but this riotous savage within him would have none of it. Then, if ever, did Freddy Drummond call upon his iron inhibition to save him. But it is written that the house divided against itself must fall. And Freddy Drummond found that he had divided all the will and force of him with Bill Tots, and between them the entity that constituted the pair of them was being wrenched in twain. Freddy Drummond sat in the auto, quite composed, alongside Catherine Van Voorst. But looking out of Freddy Drummond's eyes was Bill Tots, and somewhere behind those eyes, battling for the control of their mutual body, were Freddie Drummond the sane and conservative sociologist, and Bill Tots, the class-conscious and bellicose union-working man. It was Bill Tots, looking out of those eyes, who saw the inevitable end of the battle on the coal wagon. He saw a policeman gain the top of the load, a second, and a third. They lurched clumsily on the loose footing, but their long riot clubs were out and swinging. One blow caught the teamster on the head. A second he dodged, receiving it on the shoulder. For him the game was plainly up. He dashed in suddenly, clutched two policemen in his arms, and hurled himself a prisoner to the pavement, his hold never relaxing on his two captors. Catherine Van Voorst was sick and faint at sight of the blood and brutal fighting. But her qualms were vanquished by the sensational and most unexpected happening that followed. The man beside her emitted an unearthly and uncultured yell and rose to his feet. She saw him spring over the front seat, leap to the broad rump of the wheeler, and from there gain the wagon. His onslaught was like a whirlwind. Before the bewildered officer on the load could guess the errand of this conventionally clad but excited seeming gentleman, he was the recipient of a punch that arched him back through the air to the pavement. A kick in the face led an ascending policeman to follow his example. A rush of three more gained the top and locked with Bill Tots in a gigantic clinch, during which his scalp was opened up by a club, and coat, vest, and half his starched shirt were torn from him. But the three policemen were flung far and wide, and Bill Tots, raining down lumps of coal, held the fort. The captain led gallantly to the attack but was bowled over by a chunk of coal that burst on his head in black baptism. The need of the police was to break the blockade in front before the mob could break in at the rear, and Bill Toch need was to hold the wagon till the mob did break through. So the battle of the coal went on. The crowd had recognized its champion. Big Bill, as usual, had come to the front, and Catherine Van Voorst was bewildered by the cries of Bill. Oh you Bill! that arose on every hand. Pat Morrissey, on his wagon seat, was jumping and screaming in an ecstasy, Eat em, Bill. Eat em. Eat em alive. From the sidewalk she heard a woman's voice cry out, Look out, Bill Ront End. Bill took the warning and with well-directed coal clear the front end of the wagon of assailants. Catherine Van Voorst turned her head and saw on the curb of the sidewalk a woman with vivid coloring and flashing black eyes who was staring with all her soul at the man who had been Freddy Drummond a few minutes before. The windows of the office building became vociferous with applause. A fresh shower of office chairs and filing cabinets descended. The mob had broken through on one side the line of wagons, and was advancing, each segregated policeman the center of a fighting group. The scabs were torn from their seats, the traces of the horses cut, and the frightened animals put in flight. 
Many policemen crawled under the coal wagon for safety, while the loose horses, with here and there a policeman on their backs or struggling at their heads to hold them, surged across the sidewalk opposite the gem and broke into Market Street. Catherine Van Voorst heard the woman's voice calling in warning. She was back on the curb again, and crying out. Beat it, Bill. Now's your time. Beat it. The police for the moment had been swept away. Bill Tots leaped to the pavement and made his way to the woman on the sidewalk. Catherine Van Voorst saw her throw her arms around him and kiss him on the lips. And Catherine Van Voorst watched him curiously as he went on down the sidewalk, one arm around the woman, both talking and laughing, and he with the volubility and abandon she could never have dreamed possible. The police were back again in clearing the gem while waiting for reinforcements and new drivers and horses. The mob had done its work and was scattering, and Catherine Van Voorst, still watching, could see the man she had known as Freddie Drummond. He towered ahead above the crowd. His arm was still about the woman. And she in the motor car, watching, saw the pair cross Market Street, cross the slot, and disappear down 3rd Street into the labor ghetto. In the years that followed no more lectures were given in the University of California by one Freddie Drummond, and no more books on economics and the labor question appeared over the name of Frederick A. Drummond. On the other hand there arose a new labor leader, William Tots by name. He it was who married Mary Condon, president of the International Glove Workers Union No. 974. And he it was who called the notorious cooks and waiters strike, which, before its successful termination, brought out with it scores of other unions, among which, of the more remotely allied, were the chicken pickers and the undertakers. P. 60th E. Unparalleled invasion It was in the year 1976 that the trouble between the world and China reached its culmination. It was because of this that the celebration of the second centennial of American liberty was deferred. Many other plans of the nations of the earth were twisted and tangled and postponed for the same reason. The world awoke rather abruptly to its danger. But for over 70 years, unperceived, affairs had been shaping toward this very end. The year 1904 logically marks the beginning of the development that, 70 years later, was to bring consternation to the whole world. The Japanese-Russian War took place in 1904, and the historians of the time gravely noted it down that that event marked the entrance of Japan into the Comedy of Nations. What it really did mark was the awakening of China. This awakening, long expected, had finally been given up. The Western nations had tried to arouse China, and they had failed. Out of their native optimism and race egotism they had therefore concluded that the task was impossible, that China would never awaken. What they had failed to take into account was this, that between them and China was no common psychological speech. Their thought processes were radically dissimilar. There was no intimate vocabulary. The Western mind penetrated the Chinese mind but a short distance when it found itself in a fathomless maze. The Chinese mind penetrated the Western mind an equally short distance when it fetched up against a blank, incomprehensible wall. It was all a matter of language. There was no way to communicate Western ideas to the Chinese mind. China remained asleep. The material achievement and progress of the West was a closed book to her. Nor could the West open the book. Back and deep down on the tie ribs of consciousness, in the mind, say, of the English-speaking race, was a capacity to thrill to short, Saxon words. Back and deep down on the tie ribs of consciousness of the Chinese mind was a capacity to thrill to its own hieroglyphics. But the Chinese mind could not thrill to short, Saxon words. Nor could the English-speaking mind thrill to hieroglyphics. The fabrics of their minds were woven from totally different stuffs. They were mental aliens. And so it was that Western material achievement and progress made no dent on the rounded sleep of China. Came Japan and her victory over Russia in 1904. Now the Japanese race was the freak and paradox among Eastern peoples. In some strange way Japan was receptive to all the West had to offer. Japan swiftly assimilated the Western ideas, and digested them, 
and so capably applied them that she suddenly burst forth, full panoplied, a world power. There is no explaining this peculiar openness of Japan to the alien culture of the West. As well might be explained any biological sport in the animal kingdom. Having decisively thrashed the great Russian Empire, Japan promptly set about dreaming a colossal dream of empire for herself. Korea she had made into a granary and a colony. Treaty privileges and vulpine diplomacy gave her the monopoly of Manchuria. But Japan was not satisfied. She turned her eyes upon China. There lay a vast territory, and in that territory were the hugest deposits in the world of iron and coal he backbone of industrial civilization. Given natural resources, the other great factor in industry is labor. In that territory was a population of 400 million souls knee quarter of the then total population of the earth. Furthermore, the Chinese were excellent workers, while their fatalistic philosophy or religion and their stolid nervous organization constituted them splendid soldiers if they were properly managed. Needless to say, Japan was prepared to furnish that management. But best of all, from the standpoint of Japan, the Chinese was a kindred race. The baffling enigma of the Chinese character to the West was no baffling enigma to the Japanese. The Japanese understood as we could never school ourselves or hope to understand. Their mental processes were the same. The Japanese thought with the same thought symbols as did the Chinese, and they thought in the same peculiar grooves. Into the Chinese mind the Japanese went on where we were balked by the obstacle of incomprehension. They took the turning which we could not perceive, twisted around the obstacle, and were out of sight in the ramifications of the Chinese mind where we could not follow. They were brothers. Long ago one had borrowed the other's written language, and, until generations before that, they had diverged from the common Mongol stock. There had been changes, differentiations brought about by diverse conditions and infusions of other blood. But down at the bottom of their beings, twisted into the fibers of them, was a heritage in common a sameness in kind that time had not obliterated. And so Japan took upon herself the management of China. In the years immediately following the war with Russia, her agents swarmed over the Chinese Empire. A thousand miles beyond the last mission station toiled her engineers and spies, clad as coolies, under the guise of itinerant merchants or proselytizing Buddhist priests, noting down the horsepower of every waterfall, the likely sites for factories the heights of mountains and passes, the strategic advantages and weaknesses, the wealth of the farming valleys, the number of bullocks in a district or the number of laborers that could be collected by forced levies. Never was there such a census, and it could have been taken by no other people than the dogged, patient, patriotic Japanese. But in a short time secrecy was thrown to the winds. Japan's officers reorganized the Chinese army. Her drill sergeants made the medial warriors over into 20th century soldiers, accustomed to all the modern machinery of war and with a higher average of marksmanship than the soldiers of any Western nation. The engineers of Japan deepened and widened the intricate system of canals, built factories and foundries, netted the empire with telegraphs and telephones, and inaugurated the era of railroad building. It was these same protagonists of machine civilization that discovered the great oil deposits of Chunsid, the iron mountains of Wangxing, the copper ranges of Chinchi, and they sank the gas wells of Wawi, that most marvelous reservoir of natural gas in all the world. In China's councils of empire were the Japanese emissaries. In the ears of the statesmen whispered the Japanese statesmen. The political reconstruction of the empire was due to them. They evicted the scholar class, which was violently reactionary, and put into office progressive officials. And in every town and city of the empire newspapers were started. Of course, Japanese editors ran the policy of these papers, which policy they got direct from Tokyo. It was these papers that educated and made progressive the great mass of the population. China was at last awake. Where the West had failed, Japan succeeded. She had transmuted Western culture and achievement into terms that were intelligible to the Chinese understanding. Japan herself, when she so suddenly awakened, had astounded the world. 
but at the time she was only 40 million strong. China's awakening, with her 400 millions and the scientific advance of the world, was frightfully astounding. She was the colossus of the nations, and swiftly her voice was heard in no uncertain tones in the affairs and councils of the nations. Japan egged her on, and the proud Western peoples listened with respectful ears. China's swift and remarkable rise was due, perhaps more than to anything else, to the superlative quality of her labor. The Chinese was the perfect type of industry. He had always been that. For sheer ability to work no worker in the world could compare with him. Work was the breath of his nostrils. It was to him what wandering and fighting in far lands and the spiritual adventure had been to other peoples. Liberty, to him, epitomized itself in access to the means of toil. To till the soil and labor interminably was all he asked of life and the powers that be. And the awakening of China had given its vast population not merely free and unlimited access to the means of toil, but access to the highest and most scientific machine means of toil. China rejuvenescent. It was but a step to China rampant. She discovered a new pride in herself and a will of her own. She began to chafe under the guidance of Japan, but she did not chafe long. On Japan's advice, in the beginning, she had expelled from the empire all Western missionaries, engineers, drill sergeants, merchants, and teachers. She now began to expel the similar representatives of Japan. The latter's advisory statesmen were showered with honors and decorations, and sent home. The West had awakened Japan, and, as Japan had then requited the West, Japan was not requited by China. Japan was thanked for her kindly aid and flung out bag and baggage by her gigantic prod the Western nations chuckled. Japan's rainbow dream had gone glimmering. She grew angry. China laughed at her. The blood and the swords of the samurai went out, and Japan rashly went to war. This occurred in 1922, and in seven bloody months Manchuria, Korea, and Formosa were taken away from her and she was hurled back, bankrupt to stifle in her tiny, crowded islands. Exit Japan from the world drama. Thereafter she devoted herself to art, and her task became to please the world greatly with her creations of wonder and beauty. Contrary to expectation, China did not prove warlike. She had no Napoleonic dream, and was content to devote herself to the arts of peace. After a time of disquiet, the idea was accepted that China was to be feared not in war, but in commerce. It will be seen that the real danger was not apprehended. China went on consummating her machine civilization. Instead of a large standing army, she developed an immensely larger and splendidly efficient militia. Her navy was so small that it was the laughing stock of the world. Nor did she attempt to strengthen her navy. The treaty ports of the world were never entered by her visiting battleships. The real danger lay in the fecundity of her loins, and it was in 1970 that the first cry of alarm was raised. For some time all territories adjacent to China had been grumbling at Chinese immigration. But now it suddenly came home to the world that China's population was 500 million. She had increased by a hundred million since her awakening. Birchouder called attention to the fact that there were more Chinese in existence than white-skinned people. He performed a simple sum in arithmetic. He added together the populations of the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, England, France, Germany, Italy, Austria, European Russia, and all Scandinavia. The result was 495 million. And the population of China overlooked this tremendous total by 5 million. Birchouder's figures went round the world, and the world shivered. For many centuries China's population had been constant. Her territory had been saturated with population. That is to say, her territory, with the primitive method of production, had supported the maximum limit of population. But when she awoke and inaugurated the machine civilization, her productive power had been enormously increased. Thus, on the same territory, she was able to support a far larger population. At once the birth rate began to rise and the death rate to fall. Before, 
when population pressed against the means of subsistence, the excess population had been swept away by famine. But now, thanks to the machine civilization, China's means of subsistence had been enormously extended, and there were no famines. Her population followed on the heels of the increase in the means of subsistence. During this time of transition and development of power, China had entertained no dreams of conquest. The Chinese was not an imperial race. It was industrious, thrifty, and peace-loving. War was looked upon as an unpleasant but necessary task that at times must be performed. And so, while the Western races had squabbled and fought, and world adventured against one another, China had calmly gone on working at her machines and growing. Now she was spilling over the boundaries of her empire hat was all, just spilling over into the adjacent territories with all the certainty and terrifying slow momentum of a glacier. Following upon the alarm raised by Birchowder's figures, in 1970 France made a long threatened stand. French Indochina had been overrun, filled up, by Chinese immigrants. France called a halt. The Chinese wave flowed on. France assembled a force of a hundred thousand on the boundary between her unfortunate colony and China, and China sent down an army of militia soldiers a million strong. Behind came the wives and sons and daughters and relatives, with their personal household luggage, in a second army. The French force was brushed aside like a fly. The Chinese militia soldiers, along with their families, over five millions all told, Cooley took possession of French Indochina and settled down to stay for a few thousand years. Outraged France was in arms. She hurled fleet after fleet against the coasts of China, and nearly bankrupted herself by the effort. China had no navy. She withdrew like a turtle into her shell. For a year the French fleets blockaded the coast and bombarded exposed towns and villages. China did not mind. She did not depend upon the rest of the world for anything. She calmly kept out of range of the French guns and went on working. France wept and wailed, wrung her impotent hands and appealed to the dumbfounded nations. Then she landed a punitive expedition to march to Peking. It was 250,000 strong, and it was the flower of France. It landed without opposition and marched into the interior. And that was the last ever seen of it. The line of communication was snapped on the second day. Not a survivor came back to tell what had happened. It had been swallowed up in China's cavernous maw, that was all. In the five years that followed, China's expansion, in all land directions, went on a pace. Siam was made part of the empire, and, in spite of all that England could do, Burma and the Malay Peninsula were overrun. While all along the long south boundary of Siberia, Russia was pressed severely by China's advancing hordes. The process was simple. First came the Chinese immigration or, rather, it was already there, having come there slowly and insidiously during the previous years. Next came the clash of arms and the brushing away of all opposition by a monster army of militia soldiers, followed by their families and household baggage. And finally came their settling down as colonists in the conquered territory. Never was there so strange and effective a method of world conquest. Naples and Bhutan were overrun, and the whole northern boundary of India pressed against by this fearful tide of life. To the west, Bukhara, and, even to the south and west, Afghanistan, were swallowed up. Persia, Turkestan, and all Central Asia felt the pressure of the flood. It was at this time that Birchout revised his figures. He had been mistaken. China's population must be 700 millions, 800 millions, nobody knew how many millions, but at any rate it would soon be a billion. There were two Chinese for every white-skinned human in the world, Birchout announced, and the world trembled. China's increase must have begun immediately, in 1904. It was remembered that since that date there had not been a single famine. At five million a year increase, her total increase in the intervening 70 years must be 350 million. But who was to know? It might be more. Who was to know anything of the strange new menace of the 20th century Hina, Old China, 
rejuvenescent, fruitful, and militant. The Convention of 1975 was called at Philadelphia. All the Western nations, and some few of the Eastern, were represented. Nothing was accomplished. There was talk of all countries putting bounties on children to increase the birth rate, but it was laughed to scorn by the arithmeticians, who pointed out that China was too far in the lead in that direction. No feasible way of coping with China was suggested. China was appealed to and threatened by the United Powers, and that was all the Convention of Philadelphia came to. And the Convention and the Powers were laughed at by China. Li Tang FWUNG, the power behind the Dragon Throne, deigned to reply. What does China care for the Comedy of Nations? Said Li Tang FWUNG. We are the most ancient, honorable, and royal of races. We have our own destiny to accomplish. It is unpleasant that our destiny does not tally with the destiny of the rest of the world, but what would you? You have talked windily about the royal races and the heritage of the earth, and we can only reply that that remains to be seen. You cannot invade us. Never mind about your navies. Don't shout. We know our navy is small. You see we use it for police purposes. We do not care for the sea. Our strength is in our population, which will soon be a billion. Thanks to you, we are equipped with all modern war machinery. Send your navies. We will not notice them. Send your punitive expeditions, but first remember France. To lend half a million soldiers on our shores would strain the resources of any of you. And our thousand millions would swallow them down in a mouthful. Send a million. Send five millions, and we will swallow them down just as readily. Poof. A mere nothing, a meager morsel. Destroy, as you have threatened, you United States, the ten million coolies we have forced upon your shores high, the amount scarcely equals half of our excess birth rate for a year. So spoke Li Tang FWUNG. The world was nonplussed, helpless, terrified. Truly had he spoken. There was no combating China's amazing birth rate. If her population was a billion, and was increasing 20 millions a year, in 25 years it would be a billion and a half qual to the total population of the world in 1904. And nothing could be done. There was no way to dam up the overspilling monstrous flood of life. War was futile. China laughed at a blockade of her coasts. She welcomed invasion. In her capacious maw was room for all the hosts of earth that could be hurled at her. And in the meantime her flood of yellow life poured out and on over Asia. China laughed and read in their magazines the learned lucubrations of the distracted Western scholars. But there was one scholar China failed to reckon on Icobus Laningdale, not that he was a scholar, except in the widest sense. Primarily, Jacobus Laningdale was a scientist and, up to that time, a very obscure scientist, a professor employed in the laboratories of the health office of New York City. Jacobus Laningdale's head was very like any other head, but in that head was evolved an idea. Also, in that head was the wisdom to keep that idea secret. He did not write an article for the magazines. Instead, he asked for a vacation. On September 19, 1975, he arrived in Washington. It was evening, but he proceeded straight to the White House, for he had already arranged an audience with the President. He was closeted with President Moyer for three hours. What passed between them was not learned by the rest of the world until long after. In fact, at that time the world was not interested in Jacobus Laningdale. Next day the President called in his cabinet. Jacobus Laningdale was present. The proceedings were kept secret. But that very afternoon Rufus Cowdery, Secretary of State, left Washington, and early the following morning sailed for England. The secret that he carried began to spread, but it spread only among the heads of governments. Possibly half a dozen men in a nation were entrusted with the idea that had formed in Jacobus Laningdale's head. Following the spread of the secret, sprang up great activity in all the dockyards, arsenals, and navy yards. The people of France and Austria became suspicious, 
but so sincere were their government's calls for confidence that they acquiesced in the unknown project that was afoot. This was the time of the great truce. All countries pledged themselves solemnly not to go to war with any other country. The first definite action was the gradual mobilization of the armies of Russia, Germany, Austria, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. Then began the eastward movement. All railroads into Asia were glutted with troop trains. China was the objective, that was all that was known. A little later began the Great Sea Movement. Expeditions of warships were launched from all countries. Fleet followed fleet, and all proceeded to the coasts of China. The nations cleaned out their navy yards. They sent their revenue cutters and dispatch boats and lighthouse tenders, and they sent their last antiquated cruisers and battleships. Not content with this, they impressed the merchant marine. The statistics show that 58,640 merchant steamers, equipped with searchlights and rapid-fire guns, were dispatched by the various nations to China. And China smiled and waited. On her land side, along her boundaries, were millions of the warriors of Europe. She mobilized five times as many millions of her militia and awaited the invasion. On her sea coasts she did the same. But China was puzzled. After all this enormous preparation, there was no invasion. She could not understand. Along the great Siberian frontier all was quiet. Along her coasts the towns and villages were not even shelled. Never, in the history of the world, had there been so mighty a gathering of war fleets. The fleets of all the world were there, and day and night millions of tons of battleships plowed the brine of her coasts, and nothing happened. Nothing was attempted. Did they think to make her emerge from her shell? China smiled. Did they think to tire her out, or starve her out? China smiled again. But on May 1, 1976, had the reader been in the imperial city of Peking, with its then population of 11 millions, he would have witnessed a curious sight. He would have seen the streets filled with the chattering yellow populace, every cued head tilted back every slant eye turned skyward. And high up in the blue he would have beheld a tiny dot of black, which, because of its orderly evolutions, he would have identified as an airship. From this airship, as it curved its flight back and forth over the city, fell missiles trained, harmless missiles, tubes of fragile glass that shattered into thousands of fragments on the streets and house tops. But there was nothing deadly about these tubes of glass. Nothing happened. There were no explosions. It is true, three Chinese were killed by the tubes dropping on their heads from so enormous a height. But what were three Chinese against an excess birth rate of 20 millions? One tube struck perpendicularly in a fish pond in a garden and was not broken. It was dragged ashore by the master of the house. He did not dare to open it, but, accompanied by his friends, and surrounded by an ever-increasing crowd, he carried the mysterious tube to the magistrate of the district. The latter was a brave man. With all eyes upon him, he shattered the tube with the blow from his brass bold pipe. Nothing happened. Of those who were very near, one or two thought they saw some mosquitoes fly out. That was all. The crowd set up a great laugh and dispersed. As Peking was bombarded by glass tubes, so was all China. The tiny airships, Dispatched from the warships, contained but two men each, and over all cities, towns, and villages they wheeled and curved, one man directing the ship, the other man throwing over the glass tubes. Had the reader again been in Peking, six weeks later, he would have looked in vain for the eleven million inhabitants. Some few of them he would have found, a few hundred thousand, perhaps, their carcasses festering in the houses and in the deserted streets and piled high on the abandoned death wagons. But for the rest he would have had to seek along the highways and byways of the empire. And not all would he have found fleeing from plague-stricken Peking, for behind them, by hundreds of thousands of unburied corpses by the wayside, he could have marked their flight. And as it was with Peking, so it was with all the cities, towns, and villages of the empire. The plague smote them all. Nor was it one plague, nor two plagues. 
it was a score of plagues. Every virulent form of infectious death stalked through the land. Too late the Chinese government apprehended the meaning of the colossal preparations, the marshalling of the world hosts, the flights of the tin airships, and the rain of the tubes of glass. The proclamations of the government were vain. They could not stop the 11 million plague-stricken wretches, fleeing from the one city of Peking to spread disease through all the land. The physicians and health officers died at their posts. And death, the all-conqueror, rode over the decrees of the emperor and Li Tang Fwung. It rode over them as well, for Li Tang Fwung died in the second week, and the emperor, hidden away in the summer palace, died in the fourth week. Had there been one plague, China might have coped with it. But from a score of plagues no creature was immune. The man who escaped smallpox went down before scarlet fever. The man who was immune to yellow fever was carried away by cholera. And if he were immune to that, too, the Black Death, which was the bubonic plague, swept him away. For it was these bacteria, and germs, and microbes, and bacilli, cultured in the laboratories of the West, that had come down upon China in the reign of glass. All organization vanished. The government crumbled away. Decrees and proclamations were useless when the men who made them and signed them one moment were dead the next. Nor could the maddened millions, spurred on to flight by death, pause to heed anything. They fled from the cities to infect the country, and wherever they fled they carried the plagues with them. The hot summer was on a cobus Dale had selected the time shrewdly and d the plague festered everywhere. Much is conjectured of what occurred and much has been learned from the stories of the few survivors. The wretched creatures stormed across the empire in many million flight. The vast armies China had collected on her frontiers melted away. The farms were ravaged for food, and no more crops were planted, while the crops already in were left unattended and never came to harvest. The most remarkable thing, perhaps, was the flights. Many millions engaged in them charging to the bounds of the empire to be met and turned back by the gigantic armies of the west. The slaughter of the mad hosts on the boundaries was stupendous. Time and again the guarding line was drawn back twenty or thirty miles to escape the contagion of the multitudinous dead. Once the plague broke through and seized upon the German and Austrian soldiers who were guarding the borders of Turkestan. Preparations had been made for such a happening. And though 60,000 soldiers of Europe were carried off, the International Corps of Physicians isolated the contagion and damned it back. It was during this struggle that it was suggested that a new plague germ had originated, that in some way or other a sort of hybridization between plague germs had taken place, producing a new and frightfully virulent germ. First suspected by Vomberg, who became infected with it and died, it was later isolated and studied by Stevens, Hazenfeld. Norman, and Landers. Such was the unparalleled invasion of China. For that billion of people there was no hope. Pent in their vast and festering charnel house, all organization and cohesion lost, they could do naught but die. They could not escape. As they were flung back from their land frontiers, so were they flung back from the sea. Seventy-five thousand vessels patrolled the coasts. By day their smoking funnels dimmed the sea rim, and by night their flashing searchlights plowed the dark and harrowed it for the tiniest escaping junk. The attempts of the immense fleets of junks were pitiful. Not one ever got by the guarding sea hounds. Modern war machinery held back the disorganized mass of China, while the plagues did the work. But old war was made a thing of laughter. Naught remained to him but patrol duty. China had laughed at war and war she was getting, but it was ultra-modern war, 20th century war, the war of the scientist and the laboratory, the war of Jacobus Laningdale. Hundred-ton guns were toys compared with the micro-organic projectiles hurled from the laboratories, the messengers of death, the destroying angels that stalked through the empire of a billion souls. During all the summer and fall of 1976 China was an inferno. There was no eluding the microscopic projectiles that sought out the remotest hiding places. The hundreds of millions of dead remained unburied and the germs multiplied themselves, and, 
Tar the last, millions die daily of starvation. Besides, starvation weakened the victims and destroyed their natural defenses against the plagues. Cannibalism, murder, and madness reigned. And so perished China. Not until the following February, in the coldest weather, were the first expeditions made. These expeditions were small, composed of scientists and bodies of troops. But they entered China from every side. In spite of the most elaborate precautions against infection, numbers of soldiers and a few of the physicians were stricken. But the exploration went bravely on. They found China devastated, a howling wilderness through which wandered bands of wild dogs and desperate bandits who had survived. All survivors were put to death wherever found. And then began the great task, the sanitation of China. Five years and hundreds of millions of treasure were consumed, and then the world moved in autumn zones, as was the idea of Baron Albrecht, but heterogeneously, according to the Democratic American program. It was a vast and happy intermingling of nationalities that settled down in China in 1982 and the years that followed tremendous and successful experiment in cross-fertilization. We know today the splendid mechanical, intellectual, and art output that followed. It was in 1987, the great truce having been dissolved, that the ancient quarrel between France and Germany over Alsace-Lorraine recrudesced. The war cloud grew dark and threatening in April, and on April 17 the Convention of Copenhagen was called. The representatives of the nations of the world, being present, all nations solemnly pledged themselves never to use against one another the laboratory methods of warfare they had employed in the invasion of China. XCERPT from Walt Mervyn's Certain Essays in History. P. 81st E. Enemy of all the world it was Silas Bannerman who finally ran down that scientific wizard and archenemy of mankind, Emil Gluck. Gluck's confession, before he went to the electric chair, threw much light upon the series of mysterious events, many apparently unrelated, that so perturbed the world between the years 1933 and 1941. It was not until that remarkable document was made public that the world dreamed of there being any connection between the assassination of the King and Queen of Portugal and the murders of the New York City police officers. While the deeds of Emil Gluck were all that was abominable, we cannot but feel, to a certain extent, pity for the unfortunate, malformed, and maltreated genius. This side of his story has never been told before, and from his confession and from the great mass of evidence and the documents and records of the time we are able to construct a fairly accurate portrait of him, and to discern the factors and pressures that molded him into the human monster he became and that drove him onward and downward along the fearful path he trod. Emil Gluck was born in Syracuse, New York, in 1895. His father, Josephus Gluck, was a special policeman and night watchman, who, in the year 1900, died suddenly of pneumonia. The mother, a pretty, fragile creature, who, before her marriage, had been a milliner, grieved herself to death over the loss of her husband. This sensitiveness of the mother was the heritage that in the boy became morbid and horrible. In 1901, the boy, Emil, then six years of age, went to live with his aunt, Mrs. Anne Bartell. She was his mother's sister, but in her breast was no kindly feeling for the sensitive, shrinking boy. Anne Bartell was a vain, shallow, and heartless woman. Also, she was cursed with poverty and burdened with a husband who was a lazy, erratic ne'er-do-well. Young Emil Gluck was not wanted, and Anne Bartell could be trusted to impress this fact sufficiently upon him. As an illustration of the treatment he received in that early, formative period, the following instance is given. When he had been living in the Bartell home a little more than a year, he broke his leg. He sustained the injury through playing on the forbidden roof as all boys have done and will continue to do to the end of time. The leg was broken in two places between the knee and thigh. Emil, helped by his frightened playmates, managed to drag himself to the front sidewalk, where he fainted. The children of the neighborhood were afraid of the hard-featured shrew who presided over the Bartell house. But, summoning their resolution, they rang the bell and told Anne Bartell of the accident. 
she did not even look at the little lad who lay stricken on the sidewalk, but slammed the door and went back to her wash tub. The time passed. A drizzle came on, and Emil Gluck, out of his faint, lay sobbing in the rain. The leg should have been set immediately. As it was, the inflammation rose rapidly and made a nasty case of it. At the end of two hours, the indignant women of the neighborhood protested to Anne Bartel. This time she came out and looked at the lad. Also she kicked him in the side as he lay helpless at her feet, and she hysterically disowned him. He was not her child, she said, and recommended that the ambulance be called to take him to the city receiving hospital. Then she went back into the house. It was a woman, Elizabeth Shepstone, who came along, learned the situation, and had the boy placed on a shutter. It was she who called the doctor, and who, brushing aside Anne Bartell, had the boy carried into the house. When the doctor arrived, Anne Bartell promptly warned him that she would not pay him for his services. For two months the little Emil lay in bed, the first month on his back without once being turned over. And he lay neglected and alone, save for the occasional visits of the unremunerated and overworked physician. He had no toys, nothing with which to beguile the long and tedious hours. No kind word was spoken to him, no soothing hand laid upon his brow, no single touch or act of loving tenderness aught but the reproaches and harshness of Anne Bartell, and the continually reiterated information that he was not wanted. And it can well be understood, in such an environment, how there was generated in the lonely, neglected boy much of the bitterness and hostility for his kind that later was to express itself in deeds so frightful as to terrify the world. It would seem strange that, from the hands of Anne Bartel, Emil Gluck should have received a college education. But the explanation is simple. Her ne'er-do-well husband, deserting her, made a strike in the Nevada goldfields, and returned to her a many times millionaire. Anne Bartel hated the boy, and immediately she sent him to the Fairstown Academy, a hundred miles away. Shy and sensitive, a lonely and misunderstood little soul. He was more lonely than ever at Ferris Town. He never came home, at vacation, and holidays, as the other boys did. Instead, he wandered about the deserted buildings and grounds, befriended and misunderstood by the servants and gardeners, reading much, it is remembered, spending his days in the fields or before the fireplace with his nose poked always in the pages of some book. It was at this time that he overused his eyes and was compelled to take up the wearing of glasses, which same were so prominent in the photographs of him published in the newspapers in 1941. He was a remarkable student. Applications such as his would have taken him far. But he did not need application. A glance at a text meant mastery for him. The result was that he did an immense amount of collateral reading and acquired more in half a year than did the average student in half a dozen years. In 1909, barely 14 years of age, he was ready more than ready the headmaster of the academy said to enter Yale or Harvard. His juvenility prevented him from entering those universities, and so, in 1909, we find him a freshman at historic Bowdoin College. In 1913 he graduated with highest honors, and immediately afterward followed Professor Bridlew to Berkeley, California. The one friend that Emil Gluck discovered in all his life was Professor Bridlew. The latter's weak lungs had led him to exchange Maine for California, the removal being facilitated by the offer of a professorship in the State University. Throughout the year 1914, Emil Gluck resided in Berkeley and took special scientific courses. Tar the end of that year two deaths changed his prospects and his relations with life. The death of Professor Bridlew took from him the one friend he was ever to know, and the death of Anne Bartell left him penniless. Hating the unfortunate lad to the last, she cut him off with $100. The following year, at 20 years of age, Emil Gluck was enrolled as an instructor of chemistry in the University of California. Here the years pass quietly. He faithfully performed the drudgery that brought him his salary, and, a student always, he took half a dozen degrees. He was, among other things, a doctor of sociology, of philosophy, and of science, though he was known to the world, 
in later days, only as Professor Gluck. He was 27 years old when he first sprang into prominence in the newspapers through the publication of his book, Sex and Progress. The book remains today a milestone in the history and philosophy of marriage. It is a heavy tome of over 700 pages, painfully careful and accurate, and startlingly original. It was a book for scientists, and not one calculated to make a stir. But Gluck, in the last chapter, using barely three lines for it, mentioned the hypothetical desirability of trial marriages. At once the newspapers seized these three lines, played them up yellow, as the slang was in those days, and set the whole world laughing at Emil Gluck, the bespectacled young professor of 27. Photographers snapped him, he was besieged by reporters, women's clubs throughout the land passed resolutions condemning him and his immoral theories. And on the floor of the California Assembly, while discussing the state appropriation to the university, a motion demanding the expulsion of Gluck was made under threat of withholding the appropriation of course, none of his persecutors had read the book. The twisted newspaper version of only three lines of it was enough for them. Here began Emil Gluck's hatred for newspaper men. By them his serious and intrinsically valuable work of six years had been made a laughing stock and a notoriety. To his dying day, and to their everlasting regret, he never forgave them. It was the newspapers that were responsible for the next disaster that befell him. For the five years following the publication of his book he had remained silent, and silence for a lonely man is not good. One can conjecture sympathetically the awful solitude of Emil Gluck in that populous university. For he was without friends and without sympathy. His only recourse was books, and he went on reading and studying enormously. But in 1927 he accepted an invitation to appear before the Human Interestist Society of Emeryville. He did not trust himself to speak, and as we write we have before us a copy of his learned paper. It is sober, scholarly, and scientific, and, it must also be added, conservative. But in one place he dealt with, and I quote his words, the industrial and social revolution that is taking place in society. A reporter present seized upon the word revolution, divorced it from the text, and wrote a garbled account that made Emil Gluck appear an anarchist. At once, Professor Gluck, anarchist, flamed over the wires and was appropriately featured in all the newspapers in the land. He had attempted to reply to the previous newspaper attack, but now he remained silent. Bitterness had already corroded his soul. The university faculty appealed to him to defend himself, but he sullenly declined, even refusing to enter in defense a copy of his paper to save himself from expulsion. He refused to resign, and was discharged from the university faculty. It must be added that political pressure had been put upon the university regents and the president. Persecuted, blind, and misunderstood, the forlorn and lonely man made no attempt at retaliation. All his life he had been sinned against, and all his life he had sinned against no one. But his cup of bitterness was not yet full to overflowing. Having lost his position, and being without any income, he had to find work. His first place was at the Union Iron Works, in San Francisco, where he proved the most able draftsman. It was here that he obtained his first-hand knowledge of battleships and their construction. But the reporters discovered him and featured him in his new vocation. He immediately resigned and found another place. But after the reporters have driven him away from half a dozen positions, he steeled himself to brazen out the newspaper persecution. This occurred when he started his electroplating establishment in Oakland, on Telegraph Avenue. It was a small shop employing three men and two boys. Gluck himself worked long hours. Night after night, as policeman Kerr testified on the stand, he did not leave the shop till one and two in the morning. It was during this period that he perfected the improved ignition device for gas engines, the royalties from which ultimately made him wealthy. He started his electroplating establishment early in the spring of 1928, and it was in the same year that he formed the disastrous love attachment for Irene Tackley. Now it is not to be imagined that an extraordinary creature such as Emil Gluck could be any other than an extraordinary lover. 
in addition to his genius, his loneliness, and his morbidness, it must be taken into consideration that he knew nothing about women. Whatever tides of desire flooded his being, he was unschooled in the conventional expression of them. While his excessive timidity was bound to make his love-making unusual, Irene Tackley was a rather pretty young woman, but shallow and light-headed. At the time she worked in a small candy store across the street from Gluck's shop. He used to come in and drink ice cream sodas and lemon squashes, and stare at her. It seems the girl did not care for him, and merely played with him. He was queer, she said. And at another time she called him a crank when describing how he sat at the counter and peered at her through his spectacles blushing and stammering when she took notice of him, and often leaving the shop in precipitate confusion. Gluck made her the most amazing present silver tea service, a diamond ring, a set of furs, opera glasses, a ponderous history of the world in many volumes, and a motorcycle all silver-plated in his own shop. Enters now the girl's lover, putting his foot down, showing great anger, compelling her to return Gluck's strange assortment of presents. This man, William Sherbourne, was a gross and stolid creature, a heavy-jawed man of the working class who had become a successful building contractor in a small way. Gluck did not understand. He tried to get an explanation, attempting to speak with the girl when she went home from work in the evening. She complained to Sherbourne, and one night he gave Gluck a beating. It was a very severe beating for it is on the records of the Red Cross Emergency Hospital that Gluck was treated there that night and was unable to leave the hospital for a week. Still Gluck did not understand. He continued to seek an explanation from the girl. In fear of Sherbourne, he applied to the chief of police for permission to carry a revolver, which permission was refused, the newspapers as usual playing it up sensationally. Then came the murder of Irene Tackley, six days before her contemplated marriage with Sherbourne. It was on the Saturday night. She had worked late in the candy store, departing after 11 o'clock with her week's wages in her purse. She rode on the San Pablo Avenue service car to 34th Street, where she alighted and started to walk the three blocks to her home. That was the last scene of her alive. Next morning she was found, strangled, in a vacant lot. Emil Gluck was immediately arrested. Nothing that he could do could save him. He was convicted, not merely on circumstantial evidence, but on evidence cooked up by the Oakland police. There is no discussion but that a large portion of the evidence was manufactured. The testimony of Captain Shehan was the sheerest perjury, it being proved long afterward that on the night in question he had not only not been in the vicinity of the murder, but that he had been out of the city in a resort on the San Leandro Road. The unfortunate Gluck received life imprisonment in San Quentin, while the newspapers and the public held that it was a miscarriage of justice that the death penalty should have been visited upon him. Gluck entered San Quentin prison on April 17, 1929. He was then 34 years of age. And for three years and a half, much of the time in solitary confinement, he was left to meditate upon the injustice of man. It was during that period that his bitterness corroded home and he became a hater of all his kind. Three other things he did during the same period, he wrote his famous treatise, Human Morals, his remarkable brochure, The Criminal Sane, and he worked out his awful and monstrous scheme of revenge. It was an episode that had occurred in his electroplating establishment that suggested to him his unique weapon of revenge. As stated in his confession, he worked every detail out theoretically during his imprisonment, and was able, on his release, immediately to embark on his career of vengeance. His release was sensational. Also it was miserably and criminally delayed by the soulless legal red tape then in vogue. On the night of February 1, 1932, Tim Haswell, a hold-up man, was shot during an attempted robbery by a citizen of Piedmont Heights. Tim Haswell lingered three days, during which time he not only confessed to the murder of Irene Tackley, but furnished conclusive proofs of the same. Bert Daniker, a convict dying of consumption in Folsom Prison, was implicated as accessory, and his confession followed. It is inconceivable to us of today he bungling, 
dilatory processes of justice a generation ago. Emil Gluck was proved in February to be an innocent man, yet he was not released until the following October. For eight months, a greatly wronged man, he was compelled to undergo his unmerited punishment. This was not conducive to sweetness and light, and we can well imagine how he ate his soul with bitterness during those dreary eight months. He came back to the world in the fall of 1932, as usual a feature topic in all the newspapers. The papers, instead of expressing heartfelt regret, continued their old sensational persecution. One paper did more he San Francisco intelligencer. John Hartwell, its editor, elaborated an ingenious theory that got around the confessions of the two criminals and went to show that Gluck was responsible, after all, for the murder of Irene Tackley. Hartwell died. Anne Sherborne died too, while policeman Phillips was shot in the leg and discharged from the Oakland police force. The murder of Hartwell was long a mystery. He was alone in his editorial office at the time. The reports of the revolver were heard by the office boy, who rushed in to find Hartwell expiring in his chair. What puzzled the police was the fact, not merely that he had been shot with his own revolver, but that the revolver had been exploded in the drawer of his desk. The bullets had torn through the front of the drawer and entered his body. The police scouted the theory of suicide, murder was dismissed as absurd, and the blame was thrown upon the Eureka Smokeless Cartridge Company. Spontaneous explosion was the police explanation, and the chemists of the cartridge company were well bullied at the inquest. But what the police did not know was that across the street, in the Mercer Building, room 633, rented by Emil Gluck, had been occupied by Emil Gluck at the very moment Hartwell's revolver so mysteriously exploded. At the time, no connection was made between Hartwell's death and the death of William Sherborne. Sherborne had continued to live in the home he had built for Irene Tackley, and one morning in January, 1933, he was found dead. Suicide was the verdict of the coroner's inquest, for he had been shot by his own revolver. The curious thing that happened that night was the shooting of policeman Phillips on the sidewalk in front of Sherborne's house. The policeman crawled to a police telephone on the corner and rang up for an ambulance. He claimed that someone had shot him from behind in the leg. The leg in question was so badly shattered by three 1938 caliber bullets that amputation was necessary. But when the police discovered that the damage had been done by his own revolver, a great laugh went up, and he was charged with having been drunk. In spite of his denial of having touched a drop, and of his persistent assertion that the revolver had been in his hip pocket and that he had not laid a finger to it, he was discharged from the force. Emil Gluck's confession, six years later, cleared the unfortunate policeman of disgrace, and he is alive today and in good health, the recipient of a handsome pension from the city. Emil Gluck, having disposed of his immediate enemies, now sought a wider field, though his enmity for newspaper men and for the police remained always active. The royalties on his ignition device for gasoline engines had mounted up while he lay in prison, and year by year the earning power of his invention increased. He was independent, able to travel wherever he willed over the earth and to glut his monstrous appetite for revenge. He had become a monomaniac and an anarchist on a philosophic anarchist, merely, but a violent anarchist. Perhaps the word is misused, and he is better described as a nihilist, or an annihilist. It is known that he affiliated with none of the groups of terrorists. He operated wholly alone, but he created a thousandfold more terror and achieved a thousandfold more destruction than all the terrorist groups added together. He signalized his departure from California by blowing up Fort Mason. In his confession he spoke of it as a little experiment he was merely trying his hand. For eight years he wandered over the earth, a mysterious terror, destroying property to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and destroying countless lives. One good result of his awful deeds was the destruction he wrought among the terrorists themselves. Every time he did anything the terrorists in the vicinity were gathered in by the police dragnet, and many of them were executed. Seventeen were executed at Rome alone, following the assassination of the Italian king. 
Perhaps the most world-amazing achievement of his was the assassination of the king and queen of Portugal. It was their wedding day. All possible precautions had been taken against the terrorists, and the way from the cathedral, through Lisbon streets, was double-banked with troops, while a squad of 200 mounted troopers surrounded the carriage. Suddenly the amazing thing happened. The automatic rifles of the troopers began to go off, as well as the rifles, in the immediate vicinity, of the double-banked infantry. In the excitement the muzzles of the exploding rifles were turned in all directions. The slaughter was terrible horses, troops, spectators, and the king and queen, were riddled with bullets. To complicate the affair, in different parts of the crowd behind the foot soldiers, two terrorists had bombs explode on their persons. These bombs they had intended to throw if they got the opportunity. But who was to know this? The frightful havoc wrought by the bursting bombs but added to the confusion. It was considered part of the general attack. One puzzling thing that could not be explained away was the conduct of the troopers with their exploding rifles. It seemed impossible that they should be in the plot, yet there were the hundreds their flying bullets had slain, including the king and queen. On the other hand, more baffling than ever was the fact that 70% of the troopers themselves had been killed or wounded. Some explained this on the ground that the loyal foot soldiers, witnessing the attack on the royal carriage, had opened fire on the traitors. Yet not one bit of evidence to verify this could be drawn from the survivors, though many were put to the torture. They contended stubbornly that they had not discharged their rifles at all but that their rifles had discharged themselves. They were laughed at by the chemists, who held that, while it was just barely probable that a single cartridge, charged with the new smokeless powder, might spontaneously explode, it was beyond all probability and possibility for all the cartridges in a given area, so charged, spontaneously to explode. And so, in the end, no explanation of the amazing occurrence was reached. The general opinion of the rest of the world was that the whole affair was a blind panic of the feverish Latins, precipitated, it was true, by the bursting of two terrorist bombs. And in this connection was recalled the laughable encounter of long years before between the Russian fleet and the English fishing boats. And Emil Gluck chuckled and went his way. He knew. But how was the world to know? He had stumbled upon the secret in his old electroplating shop on Telegraph Avenue in the city of Oakland. It happened, at that time, that a wireless telegraph station was established by the Thurston Power Company close to his shop. In a short time his electroplating vat was put out of order. The vat wiring had many bad joints, and, on investigation, Gluck discovered minute welds at the joints in the wiring. These, by lowering the resistance, had caused an excessive current to pass through the solution, boiling it and spoiling the work. But what had caused the welds? Was the question in Gluck's mind. His reasoning was simple. Before the establishment of the wireless station, the vet had worked well. Not until after the establishment of the wireless station had the vet been ruined. Therefore the wireless station had been the cause. But how? He quickly answered the question. If an electric discharge was capable of operating a coherer across 3,000 miles of ocean, then, certainly, the electric discharges from the wireless station 400 feet away could produce coherer effects on the bad joints in the vat wiring. Gluck thought no more about it at the time. He merely rewired his vat and went on electroplating. But afterwards, in prison, he remembered the incident, and like a flash there came into his mind the full significance of it. He saw in it the silent, secret weapon with which to revenge himself on the world. His great discovery, which died with him, was control over the direction and scope of the electric discharge. At the time, this was the unsolved problem of wireless telegraphy as it still is today at Emil Gluck, in his prison cell, mastered it. And, when he was released, he applied it. It was fairly simple, given the directing power that was his, to introduce a spark into the powder magazines of a fort, a battleship, or a revolver. And not alone could he thus explode powder at a distance, but he could ignite conflagrations. 
The Great Boston Fire was started by him out by accident, however, as he stated in his confession, adding that it was a pleasing accident and that he had never had any reason to regret it. It was Emil Gluck that caused the terrible German-American War, with the loss of 800,000 lives and the consumption of almost incalculable treasure. It will be remembered that in 1939, because of the Picard incident, strained relations existed between the two countries. Germany, though aggrieved, was not anxious for war, and, as a peace token, sent the Crown Prince and seven battleships on a friendly visit to the United States. On the night of February 15, the seven warships lay at anchor in the Hudson opposite New York City. And on that night Emil Gluck, alone, with all his apparatus on board, was out in a launch. This launch, it was afterwards proved, was bought by him from the Ross Turner Company, while much of the apparatus he used that night had been purchased from the Columbia Electric Works. But this was not known at the time. All that was known was that the seven battleships blew up, one after another, at regular four-minute intervals. Ninety percent of the crews and officers, along with the Crown Prince, perished. Many years before, the American battleship Maine had been blown up in the harbor of Havana, and war with Spain had immediately followed Hawk. There has always existed a reasonable doubt as to whether the explosion was due to conspiracy or accident. But accident could not explain the blowing up of the seven battleships on the Hudson at four-minute intervals. Germany believed that it had been done by a submarine, and immediately declared war. It was six months after Gluck's confession that she returned the Philippines and Hawaii to the United States. In the meanwhile Emil Gluck, the malevolent wizard and arch-hater, traveled his whirlwind path of destruction. He left no traces. Scientifically thorough, he always cleaned up after himself. His method was to rent a room or a house, and secretly to install his apparatus hitch apparatus, by the way, he so perfected and simplified that it occupied little space. After he had accomplished his purpose he carefully removed the apparatus. He bade fair to live out a long life of horrible crime. The epidemic of shooting of New York City policemen was a remarkable affair. It became one of the horror mysteries of the time. In two short weeks over a hundred policemen were shot in the legs by their own revolvers. Inspector Jones did not solve the mystery but it was his idea that finally outwitted Gluck. On his recommendation the policemen ceased carrying revolvers, and no more accidental shootings occurred. It was in the early spring of 1940 that Gluck destroyed the Mare Island Navy Yard. From a room in Vallejo he sent his electric discharges across the Vallejo Straits to Mare Island. He first played his flashes on the battleship Maryland. She lay at the dock of one of the mine magazines. On her forward deck, on a huge temporary platform of timbers, were disposed over a hundred mines. These mines were for the defense of the Golden Gate. Any one of these mines was capable of destroying a dozen battleships, and there were over a hundred mines. The destruction was terrific, but it was only Gluck's overture. He played his flashes down the Mare Island shore, blowing up five torpedo boats, the torpedo station, and the great magazine at the eastern end of the island. Returning westward again, and scooping in occasional isolated magazines on the high ground back from the shore, he blew up three cruisers in the battleships Oregon Delaware, New Hampshire, and Florida he latter had just gone into dry dock, and the magnificent dry dock was destroyed along with her. It was a frightful catastrophe, and a shiver of horror passed through the land. But it was nothing to what was to follow. In the late fall of that year Emil Gluck made a clean sweep of the Atlantic seaboard from Maine to Florida. Nothing escaped. Forts, mines, coast defenses of all sorts, torpedo stations, magazines very thing went up. Three months afterward, in midwinter, he smote the north shore of the Mediterranean from Gibraltar to Greece in the same stupefying manner. A whale went up from the nations. It was clear that human agency was behind all this destruction, and it was equally clear, through Emil Gluck's impartiality, that the destruction was not the work of any particular nation. One thing was patent, namely, that whoever was the human behind it all, that human was a menace to the world. No nation was safe. 
there was no defense against this unknown and all-powerful foe. Warfare was futile a, not merely futile but itself the very essence of the peril. For a twelve month the manufacture of powder ceased, and all soldiers and sailors were withdrawn from all fortifications and war vessels. And even a world disarmament was seriously considered at the Convention of the Powers, held at The Hague at that time. And then Silas Bannerman, a secret service agent of the United States, leaped into world fame by arresting Emil Gluck. At first Bannerman was laughed at, but he had prepared his case well and in a few weeks the most sceptical were convinced of Emil Gluck's guilt. The one thing, however, that Silas Bannerman never succeeded in explaining, even to his own satisfaction, was how first he came to connect Gluck with the atrocious crimes. It is true, Bannerman was in Vallejo, on secret government business, at the time of the destruction of Mare Island. And it is true that on the streaks of Vallejo Emil Gluck was pointed out to him as a queer crank but no impression was made at the time. It was not until afterward, when on a vacation in the Rocky Mountains and when reading the first published reports of the destruction along the Atlantic coast, that suddenly Bannerman thought of Emil Gluck. And on the instant there flashed into his mind the connection between Gluck and the destruction. It was only an hypothesis, but it was sufficient. The great thing was the conception of the hypothesis, in itself an act of unconscious cerebration thing as unaccountable as the flashing, for instance, into Newton's mind of the principle of gravitation. The rest was easy. Where was Gluck at the time of the destruction along the Atlantic seaboard? Was the question that formed in Bannerman's mind. By his own request he was put upon the case. In no time he ascertained that Gluck had himself been up and down the Atlantic coast in the late fall of 1940. Also he ascertained that Gluck had been in New York City during the epidemic of the shooting of police officers. Where was Gluck now? Was Bannerman's next query. And, as if an answer, came the wholesale destruction along the Mediterranean. Gluck had sailed for Europe a month before Bannerman knew that. It was not necessary for Bannerman to go to Europe. By means of cable messages and the cooperation of the European secret services, he traced Gluck's course along the Mediterranean and found that in every instance it coincided with the blowing up of coast defenses and ships. Also, he learned that Gluck had just sailed on the Green Star Liner Plutonic for the United States. The case was complete in Bannerman's mind, though in the interval of waiting he worked up the details. In this he was ably assisted by George Brown, an operator employed by the Woods system of wireless telegraphy. When the Plutonic arrived off Sandy Hook she was boarded by Bannerman from a government tug, and Emil Gluck was made a prisoner. The trial and the confession followed. In the confession Gluck professed regret only for one thing, namely, that he had taken his time. As he said, had he dreamed that he was ever to be discovered he would have worked more rapidly and accomplished a thousand times the destruction he did. His secret died with him, though it is now known that the French government managed to get access to him and offered him a billion francs for his invention wherewith he was able to direct and closely to confine electric discharges. What? Was Gluck's reply to sell to you that which would enable you to enslave and maltreat suffering humanity? And though the war departments of the nations have continued to experiment in their secret laboratories, they have so far failed to light upon the slightest trace of the secret. Emil Gluck was executed on December 4, 1941, and so died, at the age of 46, one of the world's most unfortunate geniuses, a man of tremendous intellect, but whose mighty powers, instead of making toward good, were so twisted and warped that he became the most amazing of criminals. Old from Mr. A. G. Burnside's Eccentricities of Crime, by kind permission of the publishers, Messrs. Holliday and Whitsand. p. 104th E. Dream of Debs I woke fully an hour before my customary time. This in itself was remarkable, and I lay very wide awake, pondering over it. Something was the matter, something was wrong knew not what. I was oppressed by a premonition of something terrible that had happened or was about to happen. But what was it? I strove to orient myself. 
I remembered that at the time of the great earthquake of 1906 many claimed they awakened some moments before the first shock and that during these moments they experienced strange feelings of dread. Was San Francisco again to be visited by earthquake? I lay for a full minute, numbly expectant, but there occurred no reeling of walls nor shock and grind of falling masonry. All was quiet. That was it. The silence. No wonder I had been perturbed. The hum of the great live city was strangely absent. The surface cars passed along my street, at that time of day, on an average of one every three minutes. But in the ten succeeding minutes not a car passed. Perhaps it was a street railway strike, was my thought. Or perhaps there had been an accident and the power was shut off. But no, the silence was too profound. I heard no jar and rattle of wagon wheels nor stamp of iron shut hoofs straining up the steep cobblestones. Pressing the push button beside my bed, I strove to hear the sound of the bell, though I well knew it was impossible for the sound to rise three stories to me even if the bell did ring. It rang all right, for a few minutes later Brown entered with a tray and morning paper. Though his features were impassive as ever, I noted a startled, apprehensive light in his eyes. I noted, also, that there was no cream on the tray. The creamery did not deliver this morning, he explained. Nor did the bakery. I glanced again at the tray. There were no fresh French rolls and ly slices of stale graham bread from yesterday, the most detestable of bread so far as I was concerned. Nothing was delivered this morning, sir, Brown started to explain apologetically. But I interrupted him. The paper? Yes, sir, it was delivered, but it was the only thing, and it is the last time, too. There won't be any paper tomorrow. The paper says so. Can I send out and get you some condensed milk? I shook my head, accepted the coffee black, and spread open the paper. The headlines explained everything's plain too much, in fact, for the lengths of pessimism to which the journal went were ridiculous. A general strike it said, had been called all over the United States. And most foreboding anxieties were expressed concerning the provisioning of the great cities. I read on hastily, skimming much and remembering much of labor troubles in the past. For a generation the general strike had been the dream of organized labor, which dream had arisen originally in the mind of Debs, one of the great labor leaders of thirty years before. I recollected that in my young college settlement days I had even written an article on the subject for one of the magazines and that I had entitled it The Dream of Debs. And I must confess that I had treated the idea very cavalierly and academically as a dream and nothing more. Time and the world had rolled on, Gompers was gone, the American Federation of Labor was gone, and gone was Debs with all his wild revolutionary ideas. But the dream had persisted and here it was at last realized in fact, but I laughed, as I read, at the journal's gloomy outlook. I knew better. I had seen organized labor worsted in too many conflicts. It would be a matter only of days when the thing would be settled. This was a national strike, and it wouldn't take the government long to break it. I threw the paper down and proceeded to dress. It would certainly be interesting to be out in the streets of San Francisco when not a wheel was turning and the whole city was taking an enforced vacation. I beg your pardon, sir, Brown said, as he handed me my cigar case, but Mr. Harmed has asked to see you before you go out. Send him in right away, I answered. Harmed was the butler. When he entered I could see he was laboring under controlled excitement. He came at once to the point. What shall I do, sir? There will be needed provisions, and the delivery drivers are on strike. And the electricity is shut off guess they're on strike, too. Are the shops open? I asked. Only the small ones, sir. The retail clerks are out, and the big ones can't open. But the owners and their families are running the little ones themselves. Then take the machine, I said and go the rounds and make your purchases. Buy plenty of everything you need or may need. Get a box of candles or oh, get half a dozen boxes. And, when you're done, 
tell Harrison to bring the machine around to the club for me at later than eleven. Harm shook his head gravely. Mr. Harrison has struck along with the chauffeur's union, and I don't know how to run the machine myself. Oh, ho, he has, has he? said I. Well, when next Mr. Harrison happens around you tell him that he can look elsewhere for a position. Yes, sir. You don't happen to belong to a butler's union, do you, Harnd? No, sir, was the answer. And even if I did I'd not desert my employer in a crisis like this. No, sir, I would. All right, thank you, I said. Now you get ready to accompany me. I'll run the machine myself, and we'll lay in a stock of provisions to stand a siege. It was a beautiful first of May, even as May days go. The sky was cloudless, there was no wind, and the air was warm lmost balmy. Many autos were out, but the owners were driving them themselves. The streets were crowded but quiet. The working class, dressed in its Sunday best, was out taking the air and observing the effects of the strike. It was all so unusual, and withal so peaceful, that I found myself enjoying it. My nerves were tingling with mild excitement. It was a sort of placid adventure. I passed Miss Chickering. She was at the helm of her little runabout. She swung around and came after me, catching me at the corner. Oh, Mr. Corf. She hailed. Do you know where I can buy candles? I've been to a dozen shops, and they're all sold out. It's dreadfully awful, isn't it? But her sparkling eyes gave the lie to her words. Like the rest of us, she was enjoying it hugely. Quite an adventure it was, getting those candles. It was not until we went across the city and down into the working class quarter south of Market Street that we found small corner groceries that had not yet sold out. Miss Chickering thought one box was sufficient, but I persuaded her into taking four. My car was large, and I laid in a dozen boxes. There was no telling what delays might arise in the settlement of the strike. Also, I filled the car with sacks of flour, baking powder, tinned goods, and all the ordinary necessaries of life suggested by Harmed, who fuss around and clucked over the purchases like an anxious old hen. The remarkable thing, that first day of the strike, was that no one really apprehended anything serious. The announcement of organized labor in the morning papers that it was prepared to stay out a month or three months was laughed at. And yet that very first day we might have guessed as much from the fact that the working class took practically no part in the great rush to buy provisions. Of course not. For weeks and months, craftily and secretly, the whole working class had been laying in private stocks of provisions. That was why we were permitted to go down and buy out the little groceries in the working class neighborhoods. It was not until I arrived at the club that afternoon that I began to feel the first alarm. Everything was in confusion. There were no olives for the cocktails, and the service was by itches and jerks. Most of the men were angry, and all were worried. A babel of voices greeted me as I entered. General Folsom, nursing his capacious paunch in a window seat in the smoking room was defending himself against half a dozen excited gentlemen who were demanding that he should do something. What can I do more than I have done? He was saying. There are no orders from Washington. If you gentlemen will get a wire through I'll do anything I am commanded to do. But I don't see what can be done. The first thing I did this morning, as soon as I learned of the strike, was to order in the troops from the Presidio re thousand of them. They're guarding the banks, the mint, the post office, and all the public buildings. There is no disorder whatever. The strikers are keeping the peace perfectly. You can't expect me to shoot them down as they walk along the streets with wives and children all in their best bib and tucker. I'd like to know what's happening on Wall Street, I heard Jimmy Wombold say as I passed along. I could imagine his anxiety, for I knew that he was deep in the big consolidated Western deal. Say, Corv, Atkinson bustled up to me, is your machine running? Yes, I answered, but what's the matter with your own? Broken down and the garages are all closed. 
and my wife somewhere around Truckee, I think, stalled on the overland. Can't get a wire to her for love or money. She should have arrived this evening. She may be starving. Lend me your machine. Can't get it across the bay, Halstead spoke up. The ferries aren't running. But I tell you what you can do. There's Rawlinson H. Rawlinson, come here a moment. Atkinson wants to get a machine across the bay. His wife is stuck on the overland at Truckee. Can't you bring the Lurlet across from Tiburon and carry the machine over for him? The Lurlet was a 200-ton, ocean-going schooner yacht. Rawlinson shook his head. You couldn't get a longshoreman to lend the machine on board, even if I could get the Lurlet over, which I can't, for the crew are members of the Coast Seamen's Union, and they're on strike along with the rest. But my wife may be starving, I could hear Atkinson wailing as I moved on. At the other end of the smoking room I ran into a group of men bunched excitedly and angrily around Bertie Messiner. And Bertie was stirring them up and prodding them in his cool, cynical way. Bertie didn't care about the strike. He didn't care much about anything. He was bloss at least in all the clean things of life. The nasty things had no attraction for him. He was worth twenty millions, all of it in safe investments and he had never done a tap of productive work in his life inherited it all from his father and two uncles. He had been everywhere, seen everything, and done everything but get married, and this last in the face of the grim and determined attack of a few hundred ambitious mamas. For years he had been the greatest catch, and as yet he had avoided being caught. He was disgracefully eligible. On top of his wealth he was young, handsome, and, as I said before, clean. He was a great athlete, a young blonde god that did everything perfectly and admirably with the solitary exception of matrimony. And he didn't care about anything, had no ambitions, no passions, no desire to do the very things he did so much better than other men. This is sedition. One man in the group was crying. Another called it revolt and revolution, and another called it anarchy. I can't see it, Bertie said. I have been out in the streets all morning. Perfect order reigns. I never saw a more law-abiding populace. There's no use calling it names. It's not any of those things. It's just what it claims to be, a general strike, and it's your turn to play, gentlemen. And we'll play all right. Cried Garfield, one of the traction millionaires. We'll show this dirt where its place is he beasts. Wait till the government takes a hand. But where is the government? Bertie interposed. It might as well be at the bottom of the sea so far as you're concerned. You don't know what's happening at Washington. You don't know whether you've got a government or not. Don't you worry about that, Garfield blurted out. I assure you I'm not worrying, Bertie smiled languidly. But it seems to me it's what you fellows are doing. Look in the glass. Garfield. Garfield did not look, but had he looked he would have seen a very excited gentleman with rumpled, iron-gray hair, a flushed face, mouth sullen and vindictive, and eyes wildly gleaming. It's not right, I tell you, little Hanover said. And from his tone I was sure that he had already said it a number of times. Now that's going too far, Hanover, Bertie replied. You fellows make me tired. You're all open shop men. You've eroded my eardrums with your endless gabble for the open shop and the right of a man to work. You've harangued along those lines for years. Labor is doing nothing wrong in going out on this general strike. It is violating no law of God nor man. Don't you talk, Hanover. You've been ringing the changes too long on the God-given right to work or not to work. You can't escape the corollary. It's a dirty little sordid scrap, that's all the whole thing is. You've got labor down and gouged it, and now labor's got you down and is gouging you, that's all, and you're squealing. Every man in the group broke out in indignant denials that labor had ever been gouged, no, sir. Garfield was shouting. We've done the best for labor. Instead of gouging it, we've given it a chance to live. We've made work for it. Where would labor be if it hadn't been for us? A whole lot better off, 
Bertie sneered. You got labor down and gouged it every time you got a chance, and you went out of your way to make chances. No. No. Were the cries. There was the Teamsters strike, right here in San Francisco, Bertie went on imperturbably. The Employers Association precipitated that strike. You know that. And you know I know it, too, for I've sat in these very rooms and heard the inside talk and news of the fight. First you precipitated the strike, then you bought the mayor and the chief of police and broke the strike. A pretty spectacle, you philanthropists getting the Teamsters down and gouging them. Hold on, I'm not through with you. It's only last year that the labor ticket of Colorado elected a governor. He was never seated. You know why. You know how your brother philanthropists and capitalists of Colorado worked it. It was a case of getting labor down and gouging it. You kept the president of the Southwestern Amalgamated Association of Miners in jail for three years on trumped-up murder charges and with him out of the way you broke up the association. That was gouging labor, you'll admit. The third time the graduated income tax was declared unconstitutional was a gouge. So was the ADR bill you killed in the last Congress. And of all unmitigated immoral gouges, your destruction of the closed shop principle was the limit. You know how it was done. You bought out Farberg, the last president of the old American Federation of Labor. He was your creature are the creature of all the trusts and employers' associations, which is the same thing. You precipitated the big closed shop strike. Farberg betrayed that strike. You won, and the old American Federation of Labor crumbled to pieces. You fellows destroyed it, and by so doing undid yourselves. For right on top of it began the organization of the ILW. He biggest and solidest organization of labor the United States has ever seen, and you are responsible for its existence and for the present general strike. You smashed all the old federations and drove labor into the ILW, and the ILW called the general strike till fighting for the closed shop. And then you have the effrontery to stand here face to face and tell me that you never got labor down and gouged it. Bah. This time there were no denials. Garfield broke out in self-defense. We've done nothing we were not compelled to do, if we were to win. I'm not saying anything about that, Bertie answered. What I am complaining about is you're squealing now that you're getting a taste of your own medicine. How many strikes have you won by starving labor into submission? Well, labor's worked out a scheme whereby to starve you into submission. It wants the closed shop, and, if it can get it by starving you, why, starve you shall. I notice that you have profited in the past by those very labor gouges you mention, insinuated Brentwood, one of the wiliest and most astute of our corporation lawyers. The receiver is as bad as the thief, he sneered. You had no hand in the gouging, but you took your weck out of the gouge. That is quite beside the question, Brentwood, Bertie drawled. You're as bad as Hanover, intruding the moral element. I haven't said that anything is right or wrong. It's all a rotten game, I know. And my sole kick is that you fellows are squealing now that you're down and labor's taking a gouge out of you. Of course I have taken the profits from the gouging and, thanks to you, gentlemen, without having personally to do the dirty work. You did that for me H, believe me, not because I am more virtuous than you but because my good father and his various brothers left me a lot of money with which to pay for the dirty work. If you mean to insinuate Brentwood began hotly. Hold on, don't get all ruffled up, Bertie interposed insolently. There's no use in playing hypocrites in this thieves' den. The high and lofty is all right for the newspapers, boys' clubs, and Sunday schools hats part of the game. But for heaven's sake don't let's play it on one another. You know, and you know that I know just what Jabray was done in the building trade strike last fall, who put up the money, who did the work, and who profited by it. Brentwood flushed darkly. But we are all tarred with the same brush, and the best thing for us to do is to leave morality out of it. Again I repeat, play the game, play it to the last finish, but for goodness sake don't squill when you get hurt. 
when I left the group Bertie was off on a new tack tormenting them with the more serious aspects of the situation, pointing out the shortage of supplies that was already making itself felt, and asking them what they were going to do about it. A little later I met him in the cloak room, leaving, and gave him a lift home in my machine. It's a great stroke, this general strike, he said, as we bowled along through the crowded but orderly streets. It's a smashing body blow. Labor caught us napping and struck at our weakest place, the stomach. I'm going to get out of San Francisco, Corf. Take my advice and get out, too. Head for the country, anywhere. You'll have more chance. Buy up a stock of supplies and get into a tent or a cabin somewhere. Soon there will be nothing but starvation in this city for such as we. How correct Bertie Messner was I never dreamed. I decided that he was an alarmist. As for myself, I was content to remain and watch the fun. After I dropped him, instead of going directly home, I went on in a hunt for more food. To my surprise, I learned that the small groceries where I had bought in the morning were sold out. I extended my search to the Petrero, and by good luck managed to pick up another box of candles, two sacks of wheat flour, ten pounds of graham flour which would do for the servants, a case of tinned corn, and two cases of tinned tomatoes. It did look as though there was going to be at least a temporary food shortage, and I hugged myself over the goodly stock of provisions I had laid in. The next morning I had my coffee in bed as usual, and, more than the cream, I missed the daily paper. It was this absence of knowledge of what was going on in the world that I found the chief hardship. Down at the club there was little news. Ryder had crossed from Oakland in his launch, and Halstead had been down to San Jose and back in his machine. They reported the same conditions in those places as in San Francisco. Everything was tied up by the strike. All grocery stocks had been bought out by the upper classes. And perfect order reigned. But what was happening over the rest of the country and Chicago? New York? Washington? Most probably the same things that were happening with us, we concluded. But the fact that we did not know with absolute surety was irritating. General Folsom had a bit of news. An attempt had been made to place army telegraphers in the telegraph offices, but the wires had been cut in every direction. This was, so far, the one unlawful act committed by labor, and that it was a concerted act he was fully convinced. He had communicated by wireless with the army post at Benicia, the telegraph lines were even then being patrolled by soldiers all the way to Sacramento. Once, for one short instant, they had got the Sacramento call, then the wires, somewhere, were cut again. General Folsom reasoned that similar attempts to open communication were being made by the authorities all the way across the continent, but he was non-committal as to whether or not he thought the attempt would succeed. What worried him was the wire cutting. He could not but believe that it was an important part of the deep laid labor conspiracy. Also, he regretted that the government had not long since established its projected chain of wireless stations. The days came and went, and for a while it was a humdrum time. Nothing happened. The edge of excitement had become blunted. The streets were not so crowded. The working class did not come uptown anymore to see how we were taking the strike. And there were not so many automobiles running around. The repair shops and garages were closed and whenever a machine broke down it went out of commission. The clutch on mine broke, and neither love nor money could get it repaired. Like the rest, I was now walking. San Francisco lay dead, and we did not know what was happening over the rest of the country. But from the very fact that we did not know we could conclude only that the rest of the country lay as dead as San Francisco. From time to time the city was placarded with the proclamations of organized labor he's had been printed months before, and evidenced how thoroughly the ILW had prepared for the strike. Every detail had been worked out long in advance. No violence had occurred as yet, with the exception of the shooting of a few wire cutters by the soldiers, but the people of the slums were starving and growing ominously restless. The businessmen, the millionaires, and the professional class held meetings and passed resolutions, 
but there was no way of making the proclamations public. They could not even get them printed. One result of these meetings, however, was that General Folsom was persuaded into taking military possession of the wholesale houses and of all the flour, grain, and food warehouses. It was high time, for suffering was becoming acute in the homes of the rich, and bread lines were necessary. I knew that my servants were beginning to draw long faces, and it was amazing he hole they made in my stock of provisions. In fact, as I afterwards surmised, each servant was stealing from me and secreting a private stock of provisions for himself, but with the formation of the bread lines came new troubles. There was only so much of a food reserve in San Francisco, and at the best it could not last long. Organized labor, we knew, had its private supplies. Nevertheless, the whole working class joined the bread lines. As a result, the provisions General Folsom had taken possession of diminished with perilous rapidity. How were the soldiers to distinguish between a shabby middle-class man, a member of the ILW, or a slum dweller? The first and the last had to be fed, but the soldiers did not know all the ILW men in the city, much less the wives and sons and daughters of the ILW men. The employers helping, a few of the known union men were flung out of the bread lines. But that amounted to nothing. To make matters worse, the government tugs that had been hauling food from the army depots on Mare Island to Angel Island found no more food to haul. The soldiers now received their rations from the confiscated provisions, and they received them first. The beginning of the end was in sight. Violence was beginning to show its face. Law and order were passing away, and passing away, I must confess, among the slum people and the upper classes. Organized labor still maintained perfect order. It could well afford to tea had plenty to eat. I remember the afternoon at the club when I caught Halstead and Brentwood whispering in a corner. They took me in on the venture. Brentwood's machine was still in running order, and they were going out cow stealing. Halstead had a long butcher knife and a cleaver. We went out to the outskirts of the city. Here and there were cows grazing, but always they were guarded by their owners. We pursued our quest, following along the fringe of the city to the east, and on the hills near Hunter's Point we came upon a cow guarded by a little girl. There was also a young calf with the cow. We wasted no time on preliminaries. The little girl ran away screaming while we slaughtered the cow. I omit the details, for they are not nice you were unaccustomed to such work, and we bungled it. But in the midst of it, working with the haste of fear, we heard cries, and we saw a number of men running toward us. We abandoned the spoils and took to our heels. To our surprise we were not pursued. Looking back, we saw the men hurriedly cutting up the cow. They had been on the same lay as ourselves. We argued that there was plenty for all, and ran back. The scene that followed beggar's description. We fought and squabbled over the division like savages. Brentwood, I remember, was a perfect brute, snarling and snapping and threatening that murder would be done if we did not get our proper share. And we were getting our share when there occurred a new eruption on the scene. This time it was the dreaded peace officers of the ILW. The little girl had brought them. They were armed with whips and clubs, and there were a score of them. The little girl danced up and down in anger, the tears streaming down her cheeks, crying, Give it to him. Give it to him. That guy with the specs he did it. Mash his face for him. Mash his face. That guy with the specs was I, and I got my face mashed, too though I had the presence of mind to take off my glasses at the first. My. But we did receive a trouncing as we scattered in all directions. Brentwood, Halstead, and I fled away for the machine. Brentwood's nose was bleeding, while Halstead's cheek was cut across with a scarlet slash of a black snake whip. And, lo, when the pursuit ceased and we had gained the machine, there, hiding behind it, was the frightened calf. Brentwood warned us to be cautious, and crept up on it like a wolf or tiger. Knife and cleaver had been left behind, but Brentwood still had his hands, 
and over and over on the ground he rolled with the poor little calf as he throttled it. We threw the carcass into the machine, covered it over with a robe, and started for home. But our misfortunes had only begun. We blew out a tire. There was no way of fixing it, and twilight was coming on. We abandoned the machine, Brentwood pulling and staggering along in advance, the calf, covered by the robe, slung across his shoulders. We took turn about carrying that calf, and it nearly killed us. Also, we lost our way. And then, after hours of wandering and toil, we encountered a gang of hoodlums. They were not ILW men, and I guess they were as hungry as we. At any rate, they got the calf and we got the thrashing. Brentwood raged like a madman the rest of the way home, and he looked like one, with his torn clothes, swollen nose, and blackened eyes. There wasn't any more cow stealing after that. General Folsom sent his troopers out and confiscated all the cows, and his troopers, aided by the militia, ate most of the meat. General Folsom was not to be blamed. It was his duty to maintain law and order, and he maintained it by means of the soldiers, wherefore he was compelled to feed them first of all. It was about this time that the Great Panic occurred. The wealthy classes precipitated the flight, and then the slum people caught the contagion and stampeded wildly out of the city. General Folsom was pleased. It was estimated that at least 200,000 had deserted San Francisco, and by that much was his food problem solved. Well do I remember that day. In the morning I had eaten a crust of bread. Half of the afternoon I had stood in the bread line. And after dark I returned home tired and miserable, carrying a quart of rice and a slice of bacon. Brown met me at the door. His face was worn and terrified. All the servants had fled, he informed me. He alone remained. I was touched by his faithfulness and, when I learned that he had eaten nothing all day, I divided my food with him. We cooked half the rice and half the bacon, sharing it equally and reserving the other half for morning. I went to bed with my hunger and tossed restlessly all night. In the morning I found Brown had deserted me, and, greater misfortune still, he had stolen what remained of the rice and bacon. It was a gloomy handful of men that came together at the club that morning. There was no service at all. The last servant was gone. I noticed, too, that the silver was gone, and I learned where it had gone. The servants had not taken it, for the reason, I presume, that the club members got to it first. Their method of disposing of it was simple. Down south of Market Street, in the dwellings of the ILW, the housewives had given square meals in exchange for it. I went back to my house. Yes, my silver was gone all -all but a massive pitcher. This I wrapped up and carried down south of Market Street. I felt better after the meal and returned to the club to learn if there was anything new in the situation. Hanover, Collins, and Dachon were just leaving. There was no one inside, they told me, and they invited me to come along with them. They were leaving the city, they said, on Dachon's horses, and there was a spare one for me. Dachon had four magnificent carriage horses that he wanted to save and General Folsom had given him the tip that next morning all the horses that remained in the city were to be confiscated for food. There were not many horses left, for tens of thousands of them had been turned loose into the country when the hay and grain gave out during the first days. Bertle, I remember, who had great draying interests, had turned loose 300 dray horses. At an average value of $500, this had amounted to $150,000. He had hoped, at first, to recover most of the horses after the strike was over, but in the end he never recovered one of them. They were all eaten by the people that fled from San Francisco. For that matter, the killing of the army mules and horses for food had already begun. Fortunately for Dachon, he had had a plentiful supply of hay and grain stored in his stable. We managed to raise four saddles, and we found the animals in good condition and spirited, with all unused to being ridden. I remembered the San Francisco of the Great Earthquake as we rode through the streets, but this San Francisco was vastly more pitiable. 
no cataclysm of nature had caused this, but, rather, the tyranny of the labor unions. We rode down past Union Square and through the theater, hotel, and shopping districts. The streets were deserted. Here and there stood automobiles, abandoned where they had broken down or when the gasoline had given out. There was no sign of life, save for the occasional policemen and the soldiers guarding the banks and public buildings. Once we came upon an ILW man pasting up the latest proclamation. We stopped to read. We have maintained an orderly strike, it ran. And we shall maintain order to the end. The end will come when our demands are satisfied, and our demands will be satisfied when we have starved our employers into submission, as we ourselves in the past have often been starved into submission. Messner's very words, Collins said. And I, for one, am ready to submit, only they won't give me a chance to submit. I haven't had a full meal in an age. I wonder what horse meat tastes like? We stop to read another proclamation. When we think our employers are ready to submit we shall open up the telegraphs and place the employers' associations of the United States in communication. But only messages relating to peace terms shall be permitted over the wires. We rode on, crossed Market Street, and a little later were passing through the working-class district. Here the streets were not deserted. Leaning over the gates or standing in groups were the ILW men. Happy. Well-fed children were playing games, and stout housewives sat on the front steps gossiping. One and all cast amused glances at us. Little children ran after us, crying, Hey, mister, ain't you hungry? And one woman, nursing a child at her breast, called to Doc on, Say, fatty, I'll give you a meal for your skate em and potatoes, currant jelly, white bread, canned butter, and two cups of coffee. Have you noticed, the last few days, Hanover remarked to me, that there's not been a stray dog in the streets? I had noticed, but I had not thought about it before. It was high time to leave the unfortunate city. We at last managed to connect with the San Bruno Road, along which we headed south. I had a country place near Menlo, and it was our objective. But soon we began to discover that the country was worse off and far more dangerous than the city. There the soldiers and the ILW kept order. But the country had been turned over to anarchy. 200,000 people had fled from San Francisco, and we had countless evidences that their flight had been like that of an army of locusts. They had swept everything clean. There had been robbery and fighting. Here and there we passed bodies by the roadside and saw the blackened ruins of farmhouses. The fences were down, and the crops had been trampled by the feet of the multitude. All the vegetable patches had been rooted up by the famished hordes. All the chickens and farm animals had been slaughtered. This was true of all the main roads that led out of San Francisco. Here and there, away from the roads, farmers had held their own with shotguns and revolvers, and were still holding their own. They warned us away and refused to parley with us. And all the destruction and violence had been done by the slum dwellers and the upper classes. The ILW men, with plentiful food supplies, remained quietly in their homes in the cities. Early in the ride we received concrete proof of how desperate was the situation. To the right of us we heard cries and rifle shots. Bullets whistled dangerously near. There was a crashing in the underbrush. Then a magnificent black truck horse broke across the road in front of us and was gone. We had barely time to notice that he was bleeding and lame. He was followed by three soldiers. The chase went on among the trees on the left. We could hear the soldiers calling to one another. A fourth soldier limped out upon the road from the right, sat down on a boulder, and mopped the sweat from his face. Militia, Dakon whispered. Deserters. The man grinned up at us and asked for a match. In reply to Dakon's what's the word? He informed us that the militiamen were deserting. No grub, he explained. They're feeding it all to the regulars. We also learned from him that the military prisoners had been released from Alcatraz Island because they could no longer be fed. I shall never forget the next sight we encountered. 
we came upon it abruptly around a turn of the road. Overhead arched the trees. The sunshine was filtering down through the branches. Butterflies were fluttering by, and from the fields came the song of larks. And there it stood, a powerful touring car. About it and in it lay a number of corpses. It told its own tale. Its occupants, fleeing from the city, had been attacked and dragged down by a gang of slum dwellers oodlums. The thing had occurred within 24 hours. Freshly opened meat and fruit tins explained the reason for the attack. Dakon examined the bodies. I thought so, he reported. I've ridden in that car. It was Parrot and he whole family. We've got to watch out for ourselves from now on. But we have no food with which to invite attack, I objected. Dakon pointed to the horse I rode, and I understood. Early in the day Dakon's horse had cast a shoe. The delicate hoof had split, and by noon the animal was limping. Dakon refused to ride it farther, and refused to desert it. So, on his solicitation, we went on. He would lead the horse and join us at my place. That was the last we saw of him. Nor did we ever learn his end. By one o'clock we arrived at the town of Menlo, or, rather, at the site of Menlo, for it was in ruins. Corpses lay everywhere. The business part of the town, as well as part of the residences, had been gutted by fire. Here and there a residence still held out. But there was no getting near them. When we approached too closely we were fired upon. We met a woman who was poking about in the smoking ruins of her cottage. The first attack, she told us had been on the stores, and as she talked we could picture that raging, roaring. Hungry mob flinging itself on the handful of townspeople. Millionaires and paupers had fought side by side for the food, and then fought with one another after they got it. The town of Palo Alto and Stanford University had been sacked in similar fashion, we learned. Ahead of us lay a desolate, wasted land. And we thought we were wise in turning off to my place. It lay three miles to the west, snuggling among the first rolling swells of the foothills. But as we rode along we saw that the devastation was not confined to the main roads. The van of the flight had kept to the roads, sacking the small towns as it went. While those that followed had scattered out and swept the whole countryside like a great broom. My place was built of concrete, masonry, and tiles, and so had escaped being burned, but it was gutted clean. We found the gardener's body in the wind vanilla littered around with empty shotgun shells. He had put up a good fight. But no trace could we find of the two Italian laborers, nor of the housekeeper and her husband. Not a live thing remained. The calves, the colts, all the fancy poultry and thoroughbred stock, everything, was gone. The kitchen and the fireplaces, where the mob had cooked, were a mess while many campfires outside bore witness to the large number that had fed and spent the night. What they had not eaten they had carried away. There was not a bite for us. We spent the rest of the night vainly waiting for Dakon, and in the morning, with our revolvers, fought off half a dozen marauders. Then we killed one of Dakon's horses, hiding for the future what meat we did not immediately eat. In the afternoon Collins went out for a walk, but failed to return. This was the last straw to Hanover. He was for flight there and then, and I had great difficulty in persuading him to wait for daylight. As for myself, I was convinced that the end of the general strike was near, and I was resolved to return to San Francisco. So, in the morning, we parted company, Hanover heading south, fifty pounds of horse meat strapped to his saddle, while I, similarly loaded, headed north. Little Hanover pulled through all right, and to the end of his life he will persist, I know, in boring everybody with the narrative of his subsequent adventures. I got as far as Belmont, on the main road back, when I was robbed of my horse meat by three militiamen. There was no change in the situation, they said, except that it was going from bad to worse. The ILW had plenty of provisions hidden away and could last out for months. I managed to get as far as Baden, when my horse was taken away from me by a dozen men. 
Two of them were San Francisco policemen, and the remainder were regular soldiers. This was ominous. The situation was certainly extreme when the regulars were beginning to desert. When I continued my way on foot, they already had the fire started, and the last of Da Khan's horses lay slaughtered on the ground. As luck would have it, I sprained my ankle, and succeeded in getting no farther than South San Francisco. I lay there that night in an outhouse, shivering with the cold and at the same time burning with fever. Two days I lay there, too sick to move, and on the third, reeling and giddy, supporting myself on an extemporized crutch, I tottered on towards San Francisco. I was weak as well, for it was the third day since food had passed my lips. It was a day of nightmare and torment. As in a dream I passed hundreds of regular soldiers drifting along in the opposite direction, and many policemen, with their families, organized in large groups for mutual protection. As I entered the city I remembered the workman's house at which I had traded the silver pitcher, and in that direction my hunger drove me. Twilight was falling when I came to the place. I passed around by the alleyway and crawled up the black steps, on which I collapsed. I managed to reach out with the crutch and knock on the door. Then I must have fainted, for I came to in the kitchen, my face wet with water, and whiskey being poured down my throat. I choked and spluttered and tried to talk. I began saying something about not having any more silver pitchers, but that I would make it up to them afterward if they would only give me something to eat. But the housewife interrupted me. Why, you poor man, she said, haven't you heard? The strike was called off this afternoon. Of course we'll give you something to eat. She bustled around, opening a tin of breakfast bacon and preparing to fry it. Let me have some now, please, I begged. And I ate the raw bacon on the slice of bread, while her husband explained that the demands of the ILW had been granted. The wires had been opened up in the early afternoon, and everywhere the employers' associations had given in. There hadn't been any employers left in San Francisco, but General Folsom had spoken for them. The trains and steamers would start running in the morning and so would everything else just as soon as system could be established. And that was the end of the general strike. I never want to see another one. It was worse than a war. A general strike is a cruel and immoral thing, and the brain of man should be capable of running industry in a more rational way. Harrison is still my chauffeur. It was part of the conditions of the ILW that all of its members should be reinstated in their old positions. Brown never came back, but the rest of the servants are with me. I hadn't the heart to discharge them or creatures, they were pretty hard pressed when they deserted with the food and silver. And now I can't discharge them. They have all been unionized by the ILW, the tyranny of organized labor is getting beyond human endurance. Something must be done. P. 134th ESEA farmer that will be the doctor's launch, said Captain McElrath. The pilot grunted, while the skipper swept on with his glass from the launch to the strip of beach and to Kingston beyond, and then slowly across the entrance to Half Head on the northern side. The tide's right, and we'll have you docked in two hours, the pilot vouchsafed, with an effort at cheeriness. Rings and basin, is it? This time the skipper grunted. A dirty Dublin day. Again the skipper grunted. He was weary with the night of wind in the Irish Channel behind him, the unbroken hours of which he had spent on the bridge. And he was weary with all the voyage behind him were years and four months between home port and home port, 850 days by his log. Proper winter weather, he answered, after a silence. The town is undistinct. It will be rain and good and hardy for the day. Captain McElrath was a small man, just comfortably able to peep over the canvas dodger of the bridge. The pilot and third officer loomed above him, as did the man at the wheel, a bulky German, deserted from a warship, whom he had signed on in Rangoon. But his lack of inches made Captain McElrath a no less able man. At least so the company reckoned, and so would he have reckoned could he have had access to the carefully and minutely compiled record of him filed away in the office archives. 
but the company had never given him a hint of its faith in him. It was not the way of the company, for the company went on the principle of never allowing an employee to think himself indispensable or even exceedingly useful. Wherefore, while quick to censure, it never praised. What was Captain McElrath, anyway, save a skipper, one skipper of the eighty-odd skippers that commanded the company's eighty-odd freighters on all the highways and byways of the sea? Beneath them, on the main deck, two Chinese stokers were carrying breakfast for art across the rusty iron plates that told their own grim story of weight and wash of sea. A sailor was taking down the lifeline that stretched from the focusle, past the hatches and cargo winches, to the bridge deck ladder. A rough voyage, suggested the pilot. I, she was fair smoke in odd times, but not thought I minded pot so much as the loss of time. I hate like onithin to lost time. So saying, Captain McElrath turned and glanced aft, aloft and alow, and the pilot, following his gaze saw the mute but convincing explanation of that loss of time. The smoke stack, buff-colored underneath, was white with salt, while the whistle pipe glittered crystalline in the random sunlight that broke for the instant through a cloud rift. The port lifeboat was missing, its iron davits, twisted and wrenched, testifying to the mightness of the blow that had been struck the old triapsic. The starboard davits were also empty. The shattered wreck of the lifeboat they had held lay on the fiddly beside the smashed engine room skylight, which was covered by a tarpaulin. Below, to starboard, on the bridge deck, the pilot saw the crushed messed room door, roughly bulkheaded against the pounding seas. Abreast of it, on the smokestack eyes, and being taken down by the bosun and a sailor, hung the huge square of rope netting which had failed to break those seas of their force. Twice afore I mentioned thought or tell the owners, said Captain McElrath. But they said I would do. There was bug sees thought time. They was uncreditable bug. And thought buggest one dud the damage. Ut fair carried away the door and laid that flat on the mess table and smashed out the chief's room. He was a but sore about ut. It must a been a big un, the pilot remarked sympathetically. Aye, ut was thought. Thungs was lively for a but. I'd finish the mate. He was on the bridge with me, and I told him to'll take a look till the wedge's o number one hatch. She was taken water freely and I was no sure o number one. I dudna like the look o ut, and I was fuggerin maybe till he to tell the marn, when she took ut over abaft the bridge. My word, she was a bug one. We got a but of ut ourselves on the bridge. I dudna miss the mate aught the first, what o routin out chips and bulkhead and pot door and stretch on the tarpaulin over the skylight. Then he was nowhere to be found. The men aught the will said as he seen him going down the ladder just afore she had us. We looked for ard, we looked till hus room, I looked till the engine room, and we looked along aft on the lower deck, and there he was, on both sides the cover to the steam pipe run until the after lunches. The pilot ejaculated an oath of amazement and horror. Ay, the skipper went on wearily, and on both sides the steam pipe as well. I tell ye he was in two pieces, split clean as a heron. The sea must a caught him on the upper bridge deck, carried him clean across the fiddly, and banged him head on till the pipe cover. It sheared through him like so much butter, down atween the eyes, and along the middle of him, so that one leg and arm was fast till the one piece of hum, and one leg and arm fast till the other piece of hum. I tell ye it was fair gruesome. We put hum together and rolled hum in canvas as we pulled hum out. The pilot swore again. Oh, I'd waste no onithin tell greed about, Captain McElrath assured him. Twas a good ruddance. He was no a sailor, thought mate fellow. He was only foot for a pugsty and a dump where apology for thought same. It is said that there are three kinds of Irish Catholic, Protestant, and North of Ireland and d that the North of Ireland Irishman is a transplanted Scotchman. Captain McElrath was a North of Ireland man, and, talking for much of the world like a Scotchman, nothing aroused his ire quicker than being mistaken for a Scotchman. Irish he stoutly was, and Irish he stoutly abided, 
though it was with a faint lip lift of scorn that he mentioned mere South of Ireland men, or even orange men. Himself he was Presbyterian, while in his own community five men were all that ever mustered at a meeting in the Orange Men's Hall. His community was the island McGill, where seven thousand of his kind lived in such amity and sobriety that in the whole island there was but one policeman and never a public house at all. Captain McElrath did not like the sea, and had never liked it. He wrung his livelihood from it, and that was all the sea was, the place where he worked, as the mill, the shop, and the counting house were the places where other men worked. Romance never sang to him her siren song, and adventure had never shouted in his sluggish blood. He lacked imagination. The wonders of the deep were without significance to him. Tornadoes, hurricanes, waterspouts, and tidal waves were so many obstacles to the way of a ship on the sea and of a master on the bridge hey were that to him, and nothing more. He had seen, and yet not seen, the many marvels and wonders of far lands. Under his eyelids burned the brazen glories of the tropic seas, or h the bitter gales of the North Atlantic or far South Pacific. But his memory of them was of messed room doors stove in, of decks awash and hatches threatened, of undue coal consumption, of long passages, and of fresh paintwork spoiled by unexpected squalls of rain. I know my business, was the way he often put it, and beyond his business was all that he did not know all that he had seen with the mortal eyes of him and yet that he never dreamed existed. That he knew his business his owners were convinced, or at forty he would not have held command of the triapsic, 3,000 tons net register, with the cargo capacity of 9,000 tons and valued at 50,000 pounds. He had taken up seafaring through no love of it, but because it had been his destiny, because he had been the second son of his father instead of the first. Island McGill was only so large, and the land could support but a certain definite proportion of those that dwelt upon it. The balance, and a large balance it was, was driven to the sea to seek its bread. It had been so for generations. The eldest sons took the farms from their fathers. To the other sons remained the sea and its salt ploughing. So it was that Donald McElrath, farmer's son and farm boy himself, had shifted from the soil he loved to the sea he hated and which it was his destiny to farm. And farmed it he had, for twenty years, shrewd, cool-headed, sober, industrious, and thrifty, rising from ship's boy and focusal hand to maid and master of sailing ships and thence into steam, second officer, first, and master, from small command to larger, and at last to the bridge of the old triapsic LD, to be sure but worth her fifty thousand pounds and still able to bear up in all seas, and weather her nine thousand tons of freight. From the bridge of the Triapsic, the high place he had gained in the competition of men, he stared at Dublin Harbour opening out, at the town obscured by the dark sky of the dreary wine-driven day, and at the tangled tracery of spars and rigging of the harbour shipping. Back from twice around the world he was, and from interminable junketings up and down on far stretches, homecoming to the wife he had not seen in eight and twenty months, and to the child he had never seen and that was already walking and talking. He saw the watch below of stokers and trimmers bobbing out of the focusal doors like rabbits from a warren and making their way aft over the rusty deck to the mustering of the poor doctor. They were Chinese, with expressionless, sphinx-like faces, and they walked in peculiar shambling fashion dragging their feet as if the clumsy brogans were too heavy for their lean shanks. He saw them and he did not see them, as he passed his hand beneath his visored cap and scratched reflectively his mop of sandy hair, for the scene before him was but the background in his brain for the vision of peace that was his vision that was his often during long nights on the bridge when the old triapsic wallowed on the vexed ocean floor, her decks awash her rigging thrumming in the gale gusts or snow squalls or driving tropic rain. And the vision he saw was of farm and farmhouse and straw thatched outbuildings, of children playing in the sun, and the good wife at the door, of lowing kine, and clucking fowls, and the stamp of horses in the stable, of his father's farm next to him, with, beyond, the woodless, rolling land and the hedged fields, neat and orderly, extending to the crest of the smooth, soft hills. It was his vision and his dream, 
his romance and adventure, the goal of all his effort, the high reward for the salt plowing and the long, long furrows he ran up and down the whole world around in his farming of the sea. In simple taste and homely inclination this much-traveled man was more simple and homely than the veriest yokel. Seventy-one years his father was, and had never slept a night out of his own bed in his own house on Island McGill. That was the life ideal, so Captain McElrath considered, and he was prone to marvel that any man, not under compulsion, should leave a farm to go to sea. To this much-traveled man the whole world was as familiar as the village to the cobbler sitting in his shop. To Captain McElrath the world was a village. In his mind's eye he saw its streets a thousand leagues long, aye, and longer. Turnings that doubled earth's stormiest headlands or were the way to quiet inland ponds. Crossroads, taken one way, that led to flowerlands and summer seas, and that led the other way to bitter ceaseless gales and the perilous bergs of the great west wind drift. And the cities, bright with lights, were as shops on these long streak tops where business was transacted, where bunkers were replenished, cargoes taken or shifted, and orders received from the owners in London town to go elsewhere and beyond, ever along the long sea lanes, seeking new cargoes here, carrying new cargoes there, running freights wherever shillings and pence beckoned and underwriters did not forbid. But it was all a weariness to contemplate, and, save that he wrung from it his bread, it was without profit under the sun. The last goodbye to the wife had been at Cardiff, twenty-eight months before, when he sailed for Valparaiso with coal's nine thousand tons and down to his marks. From Valparaiso he had gone to Australia, light, a matter of six thousand miles on end with a stormy passage and running short of bunker coal. Coal's again to Oregon, seven thousand miles and nigh as many more with general cargo for Japan and China. Thence to Java, loading sugar for Marseille, and back along the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, and on to Baltimore, down to her marks with chrome ore, buffeted by hurricanes, short again of bunker coal and calling at Bermuda to replenish. Then a time charter, Norfolk, Virginia, loading mysterious contraband coal and sailing for South Africa under orders of the mysterious German supercargo put on board by the charterers. On to Madagascar, steaming four knots by the supercargo's orders, and the suspicion forming that the Russian fleet might want the coal. Confusion and delays, long waits at sea, international complications, the whole world excited over the old Triapsic and her cargo of contraband and then on to Japan and the naval port of Sasebo. Back to Australia, another time charter and general merchandise picked up at Sydney, Melbourne, and Adelaide, and carried on to Mauritius, Lurin Marks, Durban, Algoa Bay, and Cape Town. To Ceylon for orders, and from Ceylon to Rangoon to load rice for Rio de Janeiro. Thence to Buenos Aires and loading maize for the United Kingdom or the continent, stopping at St. Vincent to receive orders to proceed to Dublin. Two years and four months, 850 days by the log, steaming up and down the thousand-league-long sea lanes and back again to Dublin town. And he was well aware. A little tug had laid hold of the triopsic, and with clang and clatter and shouted command, with engines half ahead, slow speed, or half astern, the battered old sea tramp was nudged and nosed and shouldered through the dock gates into rings and basin. Lines were flung ashore, fore and aft, and a midship spring got out. Already a small group of the happy shore-staying folk had clustered on the dock. Ring off, Captain McElrath commanded in his slow thick voice. And the third officer worked the lever of the engine room telegraph. Gangway out. Called the second officer. And when this was accomplished, that will do. It was the last task of all, gangway out. That will do was the dismissal. The voyage was ended, and the crew shambled eagerly forward across the rusty decks to where their sea bags were packed and ready for the shore. The taste of the land was strong in the men's mouths, and strong it was in the skipper's mouth as he muttered a gruff good day to the departing pilot, and himself went down to his cabin. Up the gangway were trooping the customs officers, the surveyor, the agent's clerk, and the stevedores. Quick work disposed of these and cleared his cabin, the agent waiting to take him to the office. 
Did ye send word tell the wife? Had been his greeting to the clerk. Yes, a telegram, as soon as you were reported. She'll likely be coming down on the Marnin train, the skipper had soliloquized, and gone inside to change his clothes and wash. He took a last glance about the room and at two photographs on the wall, one of the wife the other of an infant he child he had never seen. He stepped out into the cabin, with its paneled walls of cedar and maple, and with its long table that seated ten, and at which he had eaten by himself through all the weary time. No laughter and clatter and wordy argument of the mess room had been his. He had eaten silently, almost morosely, his silence emulated by the noiseless Asiatic who had served him. It came to him suddenly, the overwhelming realization of the loneliness of those two years and more. All his vexations and anxieties had been his own. He had shared them with no one. His two young officers were too young and flighty, the mate too stupid. There was no consulting with them. One tenant had shared the cabin with him, that tenant his responsibility. They had dined and supped together, walked the bridge together, and together they had bedded. Och! He muttered to that grim companion, I'm quit of you, and well quit for a wee. Ashore he passed the last of the seamen with their bags, and, at the agents, with the usual delays, put through his ship business. When asked out by them to drink he took milk and soda. I am no teetotaler, he explained. But for the life o' me I can abide beer or whiskey. In the early afternoon, when he finished paying off his crew, he hurried to the private office where he had been told his wife was waiting. His eyes were for her first, though the temptation was great to have more than a hurried glimpse of the child in the chair beside her. He held her off from him after the long embrace and looked into her face long and steadily, drinking in every feature of it and wondering that he could mark no changes of time. A warm man, his wife thought him, though had the opinion of his officers been asked it would have been, a harsh man and a bitter one. Well, Annie, how is that why ye? He queried, and drew her to him again. And again he held her away from him, this wife of ten years and of whom he knew so little. She was almost a stranger or a stranger than his Chinese steward, and certainly far more a stranger than his own officers whom he had seen every day, day and day, for eight hundred and fifty days. Married ten years, and in that time he had been with her nine weeks scarcely a honeymoon. Each time home had been a getting acquainted again with her. It was the fate of the men who went out to the salt ploughing. Little they knew of their wives and less of their children. There was his chief engineer L.D., near-sighted McPherson who told the story of returning home to be locked out of his house by his four-year kitty that never had laid eyes on him before. And thus it'll be the Lottie, the skipper said, reaching out a hesitant hand to the child's cheek. But the boy drew away from him, sheltering against the mother's side. Och! She cried, and he dost not know his own father. Nor I hum. Heaven knows I could know a picked hum out of a crowd, though he'll be having your nose I'm the cun. And your own eyes, Donald. Look at them. He's your own father, laddie. Kiss hum like the little moan ye are. But the child drew closer to her, his expression of fear and distrust growing stronger, and when the father attempted to take him in his arms he threatened to cry. The skipper straightened up, and to conceal the pang at his heart he drew out his watch and looked at it. It's time to go, Annie, he said. The train will be startin'. He was silent on the train at first, divided between watching the wife with the child going to sleep in her arms and looking out of the window at the tilled fields and green unfirsted hills vague and indistinct in the driving drizzle that had set in. They had the compartment to themselves. When the boy slept she laid him out on the seat and wrapped him warmly. And when the health of relatives and friends had been inquired after, and the gossip of Island McGill narrated, along with the weather and the price of land and crops, there was little left to talk about save themselves, and Captain McElrath took up the tale brought home for the good wife from all his world's end wandering. But it was not a tale of marvels he told, nor of beautiful flowerlands nor mysterious eastern cities. What like is Java? She asked once. Full o' fever. Half the crew down with utt and little work. 
It was quinine and quinine the whole blessed time. Each morning was quinine and gin for all hands on an empty stomach. And they who was no sick made it out to be hoven up bad as the rest. Another time she asked about Newcastle. Coals and coal dust hots all. No a nice study. I lost two chinks there, stokers the both of them. And the owners paid a fine tell the government of a hundred pounds each for them. We regret tell note, they read me got the letter tell organ we regret tell note the loss o' two Chinese members o' year crew out Newcastle, and we recommend greater carefulness on the future. Greater carefulness. And I could no a been more careful. The chinks had forty-five pounds each come and tell them in wages, and I was no a them can they had run. But thoughts their way we regret tell note, we beg tell advise, we recommend, we cannot understand and the like o oh, thought. Dom cargo tank. And they would think I could drive her like a Lucania, and why up burn and coals. There was pot propeller. I was after them a good while for ut. The old one was iron, buck on the edges, and we could na make our speed. And the new one was bronze nine hundred pounds at cost, and then wantin their returns out o ut, and may want the bod passage and loss in time every day. We regret tell note your long passage from Valparaiso till Sydney with an average daily run o only 167. We had expected better results with the new propeller. You should a made an average daily run o 216. And me on a winter passage, blowing a Leuven gale half the time, with hurricane force in atween whiles, and hove to six days, with engines stopped and bunker coal running short. And me with a mate pot stupid he could no pass a shop's light odd night why up callin' me tell the brudge. I rud and told em so. And then, our nautical adviser suggests you kept too far south, and we are looking for better results from pot propeller. Nautical adviser. Poor pilot. It was the regular latitude for a winter passage from Valparaiso till Sydney. And when I come until Auckland short o' coal. After letting her drift sucks days with the fires out till save the coal, and with only twenty tons in my bunkers, I was the cano the loss in no time and the expense, and till save the owners I took her on and out while pilotage. Pilotage was no compulsory. And on Yokohama, who should I meet but Captain Robinson o the diapsic? We got a talkin' about ports and places down Australia way, and first thing he says, speakin' o Auckland f course, Captain. You was never on Auckland? Yes, I says, I was on there very recent. Oh, ho, he says, very angry like, so you was the smart Alec Pot fetched me thought letter from the owners, we note item of fifteen pounds for pilotage out Auckland. A ship o ours was until Auckland recently and uncurred no such charge. We beg to advise you thought we consider thus pilotage an unnecessary expense which should no be uncurred on the future. But did they say a word to me for the fifteen pounds I saved to them? No a word. They send a letter to Captain Robinson for no sav and then the fifteen pounds, and to me, we note item of two guineas doctor's fee at Auckland for crew. Please explain thus unusual expenditure. It was two o' the chinks. I was the con they had berry berry, and pot was the wio send un for the doctor. I buried the two of them at sea not a week after. But it was, please explain thus unusual expenditure, and tell Captain Robinson, we beg to advise you thought we consider thus pilotage an unnecessary expense. Dudna I cable them from Newcastle, telling them the old tank was pot foul she needed dry dock? Seven months out o' oh, dry dock, and the west coast the quickest place for foulin' on the world. But freights was up, and they had a charter o' coals for Portland. The errata. One o' the wear line, left port the same day as us, bound for Portland, and the old triapsic Mackin sucks knots, seven o' the best. And ut was o' comox, tackin' on bunker coal, I got the letter from the owners. The boss himself had signed ut, and o' the bottom he rud on his own hand, the errata beat you by four and a half days. Am disappointed. Disappointed. When I had cabled them from Newcastle, when she dredoked out Portland, there was whiskers on her a foot long, 
barnacles the size o oh me fust, oysters like young sauce plates. I took them two days afterward to clean the dock o shells and muck. And there was the modder o them fire bars at Newcastle. The firm ashore made them heavier than the engineer's specifications, and then forgot to charge for the difference. At the last moment, what me ashore getting me clearance, they come with the bill, tell error on fire bars, sucks pounds. They'd been tell the shop and McPherson had okay diot. I said it was strange and would no pay. Then you are dootin' the chief engineer, says they. I'm no dootin', says I, but I canna see my way tell sign. Come with me tell the shop. The launch will cost ye not and it'll brung ye back. And we will see what McPherson says. But they would no come. Ah, Portland I got the bill and a letter. I took no notice. Ah, Hong Kong I got a letter from the owners. The bill had been sent till them. I wrote them from Java explainin'. At Marseille the owners wrote me, tell extra work on engine room, sucks pounds. The engineer has OK diot, and you have no OK diot. Are you dootin' the engineer's honesty? I wrote and told them I was no dootin' his honesty. Thought the bill was for extra weight o' fire bars. And thought it was OK dud they pay it? They no dud. They must investigate. And some clerk in the office took sick, and the bill was lost. And there was more letters. I got letters from the owners and the firm teller on fire bars, sucks pounds t Baltimore, at Delgoa Bay, at Moji, at Rangoon, at Rio, and at Montevideo. It is no settled yet. I tell ye, Annie, the owners are hard to please. He communed with himself for a moment, and then muttered indignantly, Tell error on fire bars, sucks pounds. Have ye heard of Jamie? His wife asked in the pause. Captain McElrath shook his head. He was washed off the poop of three seamen. Whereabouts? Off the horn. Twas on the Thornsby. They would be running homeward bound? Aye, she nodded. We only got the word three days gone. His wife is greedin' like till die. A good lad, Jamie, he commented, but a stiff one not carryin on. I mind me when we was mates together on the Albion. And so Jamie's gone. Again a pause fell, to be broken by the wife. And you will know a heard o' the bankshire? McDewell lost her in Magellan Straits. Twas only yesterday it was in the paper. A cruel place, the Magellan Straits, he said. Dudna thought Domd made fellow nigh put me ashore twice on the one passage through? He was a idiot, a lunatic. I will na have him on the bridge of unit. Come until narrow reach, buck weather, with snow squalls, me and the chart room, Dudna I gave him the change course? Southeast by east, I told him. Southeast by east, sir, says he. Fifteen units after I comes on till the bridge. Funny, says Pot Mate Fellow, I'm no remember on any islands on the mouth o' narrow reach. I took one look at the islands and yells, Put your will hard a starboard, tell them on at the wheel. And ye should a seen the old triapsic turn in the sharpest circle she ever turned. I waited for the snow till clear, and there was narrow reach, nice as ye please, tell the east art and the islands on the mouth o' false bay till the south art. What course was ye east to run? I says tell the mo not the wheel. South by east, sir, says he. I look tell the mate fellow. What could I say? I was thought wroth I could a cult hum. Four points difference. Five minutes more and the old triapsic would a been funished. And was up no the same when we cleared the straits tell the east ard? Four hours would a seen us get and clear. I was forty hours then on the brudge. I gave the mate his course, and the bear know the ass far light astern. Don't let her bear more till the north ard than west by north, I said till hum, and ye will be all right. And I went below and turned on. But I could no sleep for Warion. After forty hours on the brudge, what was four hours more? I thought. And for them four hours will ye be letting the mate loss her on ye? No. 
I says to myself. And what thought I got up, had a wash and a cup o' coffee, and went to the brudge. I took one look at the barren o' asthar light. T'was north by west, and the old triapsic down on the shoals. He was a idiot, thought mate fellow. Ye could look overside and see the discoloration of the water. T'was a close call for the old triapsic I'm tellin' ye. Twice in thirty hours he'd a had her sure off that had no been for me. Captain McElrath fell to gazing at the sleeping child with mild wonder in his small blue eyes, and his wife sought to divert him from his woes. Ye remember Johnny McCall? She asked. Ye went to school with us two boys. Old Jummy McCall thought has the farm beyond Dr. Haythorne's place. Oh, I and what oh hum? Was he dead? No, but he was after asking your father, when he sailed last time for Valparaiso, if he'd been there for. And when your father says no, then Jummy says, and how will he be no when a tell find his way? And with thought your father says, very simple it is, Jummy. Supposin' you was goin' tell the mainland tell a mon who lived in Belfast. Belfast as a bug study, Jummy, and how would ye be findin' your way? By way o' oh me tongue, says Jummy. I'd be askin' the folk I met. I told ye it was simple, says your father. It's the very same way my Donald finds the road to Valparaiso. He asks every shop he meets upon the sea till at last he meets what the shop has been till Valparaiso, and the captain o' thought shop tells him the way. And Jummy scratches his head and says he understands and thought it's a very simple matter after all. The skipper chuckled at the joke, and his tired blue eyes were merry for the moment. He was a thun chap, thought mate fellow, Oz thun Oz you and me put together, he remarked after a time a slight twinkle in his eye of appreciation of the bull. But the twinkle quickly disappeared and the blue eyes took on a bleak and wintry look. What did he do at Valparaiso but land six hundred fathom o' chain cable and take never a receipt from the lighter moan? I was getting my clearance at the time. When we got to sea, I found he had no receipt for the cable. And he no took a receipt for it? Says I. No, says he. Ways now are going direct tell the agents. How long ha ye been going till sea, says I, not till be knowin' the mate's duty as till deliver no cargo without receipt for same. And on the west coast I thought. What's till stop the lighter moan from stealin' a few lengths o oh, it? And ut come out as I said. Six hundred went over the side, but four hundred and ninety-five was all the agents received. The lighter moan swore it was all he received from the mate our hundred and ninety-five fathom. I got a letter from the owners at Portland. They no blamed the mate for it, but me, and me ashore at the time on Shup's business. I could no be in the two places at the one time. And the letters from the owners and the agents as still come and tell me. Thought mate fellow was no a proper sailor, and no a moan tell work for owners. Dudna he want to break me with the board of trade for being below my marks? He said as much tell the bosun. And he told me tell my face homeward bound thought I'd been half an inch under my marks. Twas at Portland, loadin' cargo on fresh water and goin' till Comox to load bunker coal and salt water. I tell ye, Annie, it takes clothes fuggerin', and I was half an inch under the load line when the bunker coal was un. But I'm no tellin' any other body but you. And pot mate fellow untend until report me tell the board o' oh, trade, only for thought he saw a foot o' be sliced on two pieces on the steam pipe cover. He was a fool. After loadin' o' Portland I had till take on sixty tons o' coal to last me till Comox. The charges for lighter and was heavy, and no room o' the coal dock. A French bark was lying alongside the dock and I spoke till the captain, Askin' him what he would charge when work for the day was done, tell hall clear for a couple o' hours and let me un. Twenty dollars, said he. It was seven money on lighters till the owner, and I gave up till hum. And thought night, after dark, I held in and took on the coal. Then I started to go out on the stream and drop anchor under me own steam, of course. We had to go out stern first, and so me then went wrong with the reversing gear. 
old McPherson said he could work out by hand, but very slow I thought. And I said all right. We started. The pilot was on board. The tide was ebb and stuffly, and right abreast and a but below was a ship lying with a lighter on each side. I saw the ship's right and lights, but never a light on the lighters. It was close quarters to shift a bug vessel under steam, with McPherson working the reverse and gear by hand. We had to come close down upon the ship before I could go ahead and clear o the ships on the dock ends. And we struck the lighter stern on, just as I rung till McPherson half ahead. What was thought? Says the pilot, when we struck the lighter. I dunna know, says I, and I'm wonderin'. The pilot was no keen, ye see, till his job. I went on till a good place and dropped anchor, and ud would all a been well but for thought dumbed idiot mate. We smashed thought lighter, says he, combin' up the lighter till the bridge and the pilot stand on there with his ears cocked till here. What lighter? Says I. Thought lighter alongside the ship, says the mate. I dudna see no lighter, says I. And what thought I steps on his foot kid and hard. After the pilot was gone I says tell the mate, if you dunna know o nothing, old moan, for heaven's sake keep your mouth shut. But ye dud smash thought lighter, dudn't ye? Says he. If we dud, says I, uts know your business tell be tellin' the pilot hawk, mind ye, I'm no admuttin there was only lighter. And next marnin, just as I'm after dreshin, the steward says, a moan tell see ye, sir. Fetch him un, says I. And un he come. Sut down, says I. And he sat down. He was the owner of the lighter, and when he had told his story, I says, I dudna see ony lighter. What, moan? Says he. No see a two hundred ton lighter, bug as a house, alongside that ship? I was going by the ship's lights. Says I, and I dudna touch the shub, thought I know. But ye dud touch the lighter, says he. Ye smashed her. There's a thousand dollars damage done, and I'll see ye pay for it. Look here, muster, says I, when I'm shoved in the shop at night I follow the law, and the law do stinkly says I must regulate me actions by the lights o' the shop un. Your lighter never had no right in light. Nor did I look for any lighter without lights till show it. The mate says he begins. Dom the mate, says I. Dud your lighter have a right in light? No, a dud not, says he, but it was a clear night with the moon a showin. Ye seem to know your business, says I. But let me tell ye thought I know my business as well, and thought I'm no a lookin' for lighters without lights. If ye think ye have a case, Go ahead. The steward will show ye out. Good day. And thought was the end o' it. But ut will show ye what a poor fellow thought mate was. I call ut a blessin' for all master's hot he was sliced unto on pot steam pipe cover. He had a pull on the office and thought was the why he was kept on. The Weckley farm will soon be for sale, so the agents be tellin' me, his wife remarked slyly watching what effect her announcement would have upon him. His eyes flashed eagerly on the instant, and he straightened up as might a man about to engage in some agreeable task. It was the farm of his vision, adjoining his father's, and her own people farmed not a mile away. We will be by an ut, he said, though we will be no tellin' a soul of ut until ut's bought and the money paid down. I've savin' considerable these days, Though pickins us know what they used to be, and we have a tidy nest egg laid by. I will see the father and hove the money ready till his hand, so if I'm ought see he can buy whenever the land offers. He rubbed the frosted moisture from the inside of the window and peered out at the pouring rain, through which he could discern nothing. When I was a young man I used to be afeard thought the owners would give me the sack. Still afeard I am of the sack. But once thought farm is mine I will no be afeard any longer. It's a poor job the sea farmin. Me managin' on all seas and weather and perils o' oh, the deep a ship worth fifty thousand pounds, with cargoes o oh, times worth fifty thousand more hundred thousand pounds, half a million dollars as the Yankees say, 
and may want all the responsibility getting a screw o 20 pounds a month. What Mona sure, manage in a business worth a hundred thousand pounds while be getting as small a screw as 20 pounds. And what such masters as a captain serves he owners, the underwriters, and the board o trade, all pullin' and wantin' different things he owners wantin' quick passages and dom the rusk, the underwriters wantin' safe passages and dom the delay, and the board o trade wantin' cautious passages and caution always mean and delay. Three different masters, and all three will and willin' to break ye if ye don't serve their different wishes. He felt the train slackening speed, and peered again through the misty window. He stood up, buttoned his overcoat, turned up the collar, and awkwardly gathered the child, still asleep, in his arms. I will see the father, he said, and have the money ready till Hus Han so if I'm ought see when the land offers he will know must the chance till buy. And then the owners can gov me the sack as soon as they like. It will be all night on, and I will be with you, Annie, and the sea can go till hell. Happiness was in both their faces at the prospect, and for a moment both saw the same vision of peace. Annie leaned toward him, and as the train stopped they kissed each other across the sleeping child. Pages 161 Samuel Margaret Hennon would have been a striking figure under any circumstances, but never more so than when I first chanced upon her, a sack of brain of fully a hundred weight on her shoulder, as she walked with sure though tottering stride from the car tail to the stable, pausing for an instant to gather strength at the foot of the steep steps that led to the grain bin. There were four of these steps, and she went up them, a step at a time, slowly, unwaveringly, and with so dogged certitude that it never entered my mind that her strength could fail her and let that hundred weight sack fall from the lean and withered frame that Welney doubled under it. For she was patently an old woman, and it was her age that made me linger by the cart and watch. Six times she went between the cart and the stable, each time with a full sack on her back, and beyond passing the time of day with me she took no notice of my presence. Then, the cart empty, she fumbled for matches and lighted a short clay pipe, pressing down the burning surface of the tobacco with a callous and apparently nerveless thumb. The hands were noteworthy. They were large-knuckled, sinewy and malformed by labor, rhymed with calluses, the nails blunt and broken, and with here and there cuts and bruises, healed and healing, such as are common to the hands of hard-working men. On the back were huge, upstanding veins, eloquent of age and toil. Looking at them, it was hard to believe that they were the hands of the woman who had once been the Belle of Island McGill. This last, of course, I learned later. At the time I knew neither her history nor her identity. She wore heavy man's brogans. Her legs were stockingless, and I had noticed when she walked that her bare feet were thrust into the crinkly, iron-like shoes that sloshed about her lean ankles at every step. Her figure, shapeless and wasteless, was garbed in a rough man's shirt and in a ragged flannel petticoat that had once been red. But it was her face, wrinkled, withered and weather-beaten, surrounded by an aureole of unkempt and straggling wisps of grayish hair, that caught and held me. Neither drifted hair nor serried wrinkles could hide the splendid dome of a forehead, high and broad without verging in the slightest on the abnormal. The sunken cheeks and pinched nose told little of the quality of the life that flickered behind those clear blue eyes of hers. Despite the minity of wrinkle work that somehow failed to weasen them, her eyes were clear as a girl's leer, outlooking, and far-seeing, and with an open and unblinking steadfastness of gaze that was disconcerting. The remarkable thing was the distance between them. It is a lucky man or woman who has the width of an eye between, but with Margaret Hennon the width between her eyes was fully that of an eye and a half. Yet so symmetrically molded was her face that this remarkable feature produced no uncanny effect, and, for that matter, would have escaped the casual observer's notice. The mouth, shapeless and toothless, with downturned corners and lips dry and parchment-like, nevertheless lacked the muscular slackness so usual with age. The lips might have been those of a mummy, save for that impression of rigid firmness they gave. Not that they were atrophied. On the contrary, they seemed tense and set with the muscular and the spiritual determination. There, and in the eyes, 
was the secret of the certitude with which she carried the heavy sacks up the steep steps, with never a false step or overbalance, and emptied them in the grain bin. You are an old woman to be working like this, I ventured. She looked at me with that strange, unblinking gaze, and she thought and spoke with the slow deliberateness that characterized everything about her, as if well aware of an eternity that was hers and in which there was no need for haste. Again I was impressed by the enormous certitude of her. In this eternity that seemed so indubitably hers, there was time and to spare for safe footing and stable equilibrium or certitude, in short. No more in her spiritual life than in carrying the hundred weights of grain was there a possibility of a misstep or an overbalancing. The feeling produced in me was uncanny. Here was a human soul that, save for the most glimmering of contacts, was beyond the humanness of me. And the more I learned of Margaret Hennon in the weeks that followed the more mysteriously remote she became. She was as alien as a far journeyer from some other star, and no hint could she nor all the countryside give me of what forms of living, what heats of feeling, or rules of philosophic contemplation actuated her in all that she had been and was. I will be Suvani to come Good Friday a fortnight, she said in reply to my question. But you are an old woman to be doing this man's work, and a strong man's work at that, I insisted. Again she seemed to immerse herself in that atmosphere of contemplative eternity, and so strangely did it affect me that I should not have been surprised to have awaked a century or so later and found her just beginning to enunciate her reply. The work has to be done, and I am beholden to no one. But have you no children, no family, relations? Oh, I, a plenty o' them, but they no see foot to be helping me. She drew out her pipe for a moment, then added, with a nod of her head toward the house, I love what may self. I glanced at their house, straw-thatched and commodious, at the large stable, and at the large array of fields I knew must belong with the place. It is a big bit of land for you to farm by yourself. Oh, I, a bug butt, Suwundi Acres. A kept me old moan buzzy, along with a son and a hired moan. Tell say no auto extra hans on the harvest and a maid servant on the house. She clambered into the cart, gathered the reins in her hands, and quizzed me with her keen, shrewd eyes. But like ye hail from over the water, Maruki, I meanin? Yes, I'm a Yankee, I answered. Ye well know be Findon Money Island McGill folk stop on an Amaruki? No. I don't remember ever meeting one in the States. She nodded her head. They are home leuven bodies, though I will no be saying they are no fair travelled. Yet they come home at the last, them oz are no lost aught sea or cult by fevers and such like on foreign parts. Then your sons will have gone to sea and come home again? I queried. Oh, I, all Savin Samuel Oz was drowned. At the mention of Samuel I could have sworn to a strange light in her eyes and it seemed to me, as by some telepathic flash, that I divined in her a tremendous wistfulness, an immense yearning. It seemed to me that here was the key to her inscrutableness, the clue that if followed properly would make all her strangeness plain. It came to me that here was a contact and that for the moment I was glimpsing into the soul of her. The question was tickling on my tongue, but she forestalled me. She tched to the horse, and with a good day tell you, sir, drove off. A simple, homely people are the folk of Island McGill, and I doubt if a more sober, thrifty, and industrious folk is to be found in all the world. Meeting them abroad indeed to meet them abroad one must meet them on the sea, for a hybrid seafaring and farmer breed are they knee would never take them to be Irish. Irish they claim to be, speaking of the north of Ireland with pride and sneering at their Scottish brothers. Yet Scotch they undoubtedly are, transplanted Scotch of long ago, it is true, but nonetheless Scotch, with a thousand traits, to say nothing of their tricks of speech and woolly utterance, which nothing less than their Scotch clannishness could have preserved to this late day. A narrow lock, scarcely half a mile wide, separates Island McGill from the mainland of Ireland. And, once across this lock, one finds himself in an entirely different country. The Scotch impression is strong, 
and the people, to commence with, are Presbyterians. When it is considered that there is no public house in all the island and that seven thousand souls dwell therein, some idea may be gained of the temperateness of the community. Wedded to old ways, public opinion and the ministers are powerful influences, while fathers and mothers are revered and obeyed as in few other places in this modern world. Courting lasts never later than ten at night, and no girl walks out with her young man without her parents' knowledge and consent. The young men go down to the sea and sow their wild oats in the wicked ports, returning periodically, between voyages, to live the old intensive morality, to court till ten o'clock, to sit under the minister each Sunday, and to listen at home to the same stern precepts that the elders preached to them from the time they were laddies. Much they learned of women in the ends of the earth, these seafaring sons, yet a canny wisdom was theirs and they never brought wives home with them. The one solitary exception to this had been the schoolmaster, who had been guilty of bringing a wife from half a mile the other side of the lock. For this he had never been forgiven, and he rested under a cloud for the remainder of his days. At his death the wife went back across the lock to her own people, and the blot on the escutcheon of Island McGill was erased. In the end the sailor men married girls of their own homeland and settled down to become exemplars of all the virtues for which the island was noted. Island McGill was without a history. She boasted none of the events that go to make history. There had never been any wearing of the green, any Fenian conspiracies, any land disturbances. There had been but one eviction, and that purely technical test case, and on advice of the tenant's lawyer. So Island McGill was without annals. History had passed her by. She paid her taxes, acknowledged her crown rulers, and left the world alone. All she asked in return was that the world should leave her alone. The world was composed of two parts Land McGill and the rest of it and whatever was not Island McGill was outlandish and barbarian. And well she knew, for did not her seafaring sons bring home report of that world and its ungodly ways? It was from the skipper of a Glasgow tramp, as passenger from Colombo to Rangoon, that I had first learned of the existence of Island McGill. And it was from him that I had carried the letter that gave me entrance to the house of Mrs. Ross, widow of a master mariner, with a daughter living with her and with two sons, master mariners themselves and out upon the sea. Mrs. Ross did not take in boarders, and it was Captain Ross's letter alone that had enabled me to get from her bed and board. In the evening, after my encounter with Margaret Hennon, I questioned Mrs. Ross, and I knew on the instant that I had in truth stumbled upon mystery. Like all Island McGill folk, as I was soon to discover, Mrs. Ross was at first averse to discussing Margaret Hennon at all. Yet it was from her I learned that evening that Margaret Hennon had once been one of the island bells. Herself the daughter of a well-to-do farmer, she had married Thomas Hennon, equally well-to-do. Beyond the usual housewife's tasks she had never been accustomed to work, unlike many of the island women, she had never lent a hand in the fields. But what of her children? I asked. Two o' oh, the sons, Jamie and Timothy us married and be goon tell see. Thought bug house close tell the post office us Jamie's. The daughters hot ha no married be leuven with them as dud marry. And the rest be dead. The Samuels, Clara interpolated, with what I suspected was a giggle. She was Mrs. Ross's daughter, a strapping young woman with handsome features and remarkably handsome black eyes. Tus not to be smuck or not. Her mother reproved her. The Samuels? I intervened. I don't understand. Her four sons thought died. And were they all named Samuel? I. A strange, I commented in lagging silence. Very strange, Mrs. Ross affirmed, proceeding stolidly with the knitting of the woolen singlet on her knees knee of the countless undergarments that she interminably knitted for her skipper sons. And it was only the Samuels that died? I queried, in further attempt. The others louved, was the answer. A fine fomulio finer on the island. No better lads ever sailed out of Island McGill. The Munster held them up as models till potter after. Nor was ever a whisper breathed again the girls. 
but why is she left alone now in her old age? I persisted. Why don't her own flesh and blood look after her? Why does she live alone? Don't they ever go to see her or care for her? Never a one on twenty years and more now. She fetched it on till herself. She drove them from their house just as she drove old Tom Hennon, thought was her husband, till his death. Drink? I ventured. Mrs. Ross shook her head scornfully, as if drink was a weakness beneath the weakest of Island McGill. A long pause followed, during which Mrs. Ross knitted solidly on, only nodding permission when Clara's young man, mate on one of the Shire Line sailing ships, came to walk out with her. I studied the half-dozen ostrich eggs, hanging in the corner against the wall like a cluster of some monstrous fruit. On each shell were painted precipitous and impossible seas through which full-rigged ships foamed with a lack of perspective only equaled by their sharp technical perfection. On the mantelpiece stood two large pearl shells, obviously a pair, intricately carved by the patient hands of New Caledonian convicts. In the center of the mantel was a stuffed bird of paradise, while about the room were scattered gorgeous shells from the southern seas, delicate sprays of coral sprouting from barnacled pie pie shells and cased in glass, assegais from South Africa, stone axes from New Guinea. Huge Alaskan tobacco pouches beaded with heraldic totem designs, a boomerang from Australia, divers' ships in glass bottles, a cannibal kai kai bowl from the Marquesas, and fragile cabinets from China and the Indies and inlaid with mother of pearl and precious woods. I gazed at this very trove brought home by sailor sons and pondered the mystery of Margaret Hennon, who had driven her husband to his death and been forsaken by all her kin. It was not the drink. Then what was it? Oh, shocking cruelty? Some amazing infidelity? Or some fearful, old-world peasant crime? I broached my theories, but to all Mrs. Ross shook her head. It was no thought, she said. Margaret was a good wife and a good mother, and I doubt she would harm a fly. She brought up her foamily god fear and decent-minded. Her trouble was thought she took lunatic or an idiot. Mrs. Ross tapped significantly on her forehead to indicate a state of adamant. But I talked with her this afternoon, I objected, and I found her a sensible woman remarkably bright for one of her years. I, and I'm granting all thought you say, she went on calmly. But I'm no referring to thought. I am referring to her wucked headed and vicious stubbornness. No more stubborn woman ever loved than Margaret Hennon. It was all on account o' Samuel, which was the name o' her youngest and they do say her favorite brother Amos died by his own hand all through the Munster's mistake on no register on the new church at Dublin. It was a lesson thought the name was misfortunate, but she would no take it, and there was talk when she called her first child Samuel um thought died o' the croup. And what thought what does she do but call the next one Samuel, and hum only three when he fell until the tub o' hot water and was plain cooked till death. But all come, I tell you, o' oh her wucked headed and foolish stubbornness. For a Samuel she must have. And it was the death of the four of her sons. After the first, didna her own mother go down on the dirt till her feet, a beg gun and pleadin' with her no till name her next one Samuel? But she was no till be turned from her purpose. Margaret Hennon was always set on her ways, and never more so thought on thought named Samuel. She was fair lunatic on Samuel. Dudna her neighbors and all couth and kind savin them thought love it on the house with her, get up and walk out at the christening of the second um thought was cooked. Thought they did, and at the very moment the munester asked what would the baron's name be. Samuel, says she. And what thought they got up and walked out and left the house. And at the door Dudna her Aunt Fanny, her mother's sister, turn and say loud for all till here, what for will she be wanting till murder the wee thing? The munester heard fine, and Dudna like ut, but, as he told my Larry afterward, what could he do? It was the woman's wash, and there was no law again a mother callin her child according till her wash. And then was there no the third Samuel? And when he was lost at sea off the Cape, didna she break all laws o' nature till have a fourth? 
she was 47, I'm telling ye, and she had a child at 47. Thunk on it. At 47. It was fair scandalous. From Clara, next morning, I got the tale of Margaret Hennon's favorite brother. And from here and there, in the week that followed, I pieced together the tragedy of Margaret Hennon. Samuel Dundee had been the youngest of Margaret's four brothers, and, as Clara told me, she had well nigh worshipped him. He was going to sea at the time, skipper of one of the sailing ships of the bank line, when he married Agnes Hewitt. She was described as a slender wisp of a girl, delicately featured and with a nervous organization of the supersensitive order. Theirs had been the first marriage in the new church, and after a two weeks honeymoon, Samuel had kissed his bride goodbye and sailed in command of the loft bank, a big four masted bark. And it was because of the new church that the minister's blunder occurred. Nor was it the blunder of the minister alone, as one of the elders later explained. For it was equally the blunder of the whole presbytery of Colleen, which included fifteen churches on Island McGill and the mainland. The old church, beyond repair, had been torn down and a new one built on the original foundation. Looking upon the foundation stones as similar to a ship's keel, it never entered the minister's nor the presbytery's head that the new church was legally any other than the old church. And three couples was married the first week on the new church, Clara said. First of all, Samuel Dundee and Agnes Hewitt. The next day Albert Mayen and Minnie Duncan and by the weekend Eddie Troy and Flo McIntosh LL Sailor Men, and on sucks weeks time the last of them back tell their ships and awa, and no one o' them dreamin' of the wickedness they'd been aught. The imp of the perverse must have chuckled at the situation. All things favored. The marriages had taken place in the first week of May, and it was not till three months later that the minister, as required by law, made his quarterly report to the civil authorities in Dublin. Promptly came back the announcement that his church had no legal existence, not being registered according to the law's demands. This was overcome by prompt registration. But the marriages were not to be so easily remedied. The three sailor husbands were away, and their wives, in short, were not their wives. But the munister was no for alarm in the bodies, said Clara. He kept his counsel and bided his time, waiting for the lads to be back from sea. Oz luck would have it, he was away across the island till a christening when Albert Mayen arrives home unexpected, his ship just docked at Dublin. It's nine o'clock at night when the munister, on his slippers and dressing gown, gets the news. Up he jumps and calls for horse and saddle, and awa he goes like the one for Albert Mayen's. Albert has just gone to bed and has one shoe off when the minister arrives. Come with me, the pair o' ye, says he, breathless like. What for, and me dead weary and gone to bed? Says Albert. Y'all be lawful married, says the minister. Albert looks black and says, Now, minister, ye will be joking, but tell himself, as I've heard him tell mony a time. He is wondering thought the munister should a took tell whisky at his time o life. We be no married? Says Minnie. He shook his head. And I am no musses man? No, says he, ye are no musses man. Ye are plain mus dungan. But ye married us yersel, says she. I dud and I dudna, says he. And what thought he tells them the whole upshot, and Albert puts on his shoe. And they go with the munister and are married proper and lawful, and as Albert Mayen says afterward monies the time, tus know every moan thought has two wedding nights on Island McGill. Six months later Eddie Troy came home and was promptly remarried. But Samuel Dundee was away on a three years voyage and his ship fell overdue. Further to complicate the situation, a baby boy, past two years old, was waiting for him in the arms of his wife. The months passed and the wife grew thin with worrying. Uts no may self I'm the canon, she is reported to have said many times, but uts the poor fatherless bairn. Uf ought happened till Samuel where will the bairn stand? Lloyd's posted the loft bank as missing, and the owners ceased the monthly remittance of Samuel's half pay to his wife. It was the question of the child's legitimacy that preyed on her mind, 
and, when all hope of Samuel's return was abandoned, she drowned herself and the child in the loch. And here enters the greater tragedy. The loch bank was not lost. By a series of sea disasters and delays too interminable to relate, she had made one of those long, unsighted passages such as occur once or twice in half a century. How the imp must have held both his sides. Back from the sea came Samuel, and when they broke the news to him something else broke somewhere in his heart or head. Next morning they found him where he had tried to kill himself across the grave of his wife and child. Never in the history of Island McGill was there so fearful a death bed. He spat in the minister's face and reviled him, and died blaspheming so terribly that those that tended on him did so with averted gaze and trembling hands. And, in the face of all this, Margaret Hennon named her first child Samuel. How account for the woman's stubbornness? Or was it a morbid obsession that demanded a child of hers should be named Samuel? Her third child was a girl, named after herself, and the fourth was a boy again. Despite the strokes of fate that had already bereft her, and despite the loss of friends and relatives, she persisted in her resolve to name the child after her brother. She was shunned at church by those who had grown up with her. Her mother, after a final appeal, left her house with a warning that if the child were so named she would never speak to her again. And though the old lady lived thirty-odd years longer she kept her word. The minister agreed to christen the child any name but Samuel, and every other minister on Island McGill refused to christen it by the name she had chosen. There was talk on the part of Margaret Hennon of going to law at the time, but in the end she carried the child to Belfast and there headed christened Samuel. And then nothing happened. The whole island was confuted. The boy grew and prospered. The schoolmaster never ceased averring that it was the brightest lad he had ever seen. Samuel had a splendid constitution, a tremendous grip on life. To everybody's amazement he escaped the usual run of childish afflictions. Measles, whooping cough and mumps knew him not. He was armor-clad against germs, immune to all disease. Headaches and airaches were things unknown. Never so much as a boil or a pumple, as one of the old bodies told me, ever marred his healthy skin. He broke school records in scholarship and athletics, and whipped every boy of his size or years on Island McGill. It was a triumph for Margaret Hennon. This paragon was hers, and it bore the cherished name. With the one exception of her mother, friends and relatives drifted back and acknowledged that they had been mistaken. Though there were old crones who still abided by their opinion and who shook their heads ominously over their cups of tea. The boy was too wonderful to last. There was no escaping the curse of the name his mother had wickedly laid upon him. The young generation joined Margaret Hennon in laughing at them, but the old crones continued to shake their heads. Other children followed. Margaret Hennon's fifth was a boy, whom she called Jamie, and in rapid succession followed three girls, Alice, Sarah, and Nora, the boy Timothy, and two more girls, Florence and Katie. Katie was the last and eleventh, and Margaret Hennon, at thirty-five, ceased from her exertions. She had done well by Island McGill and the Queen. Nine healthy children were hers. All prospered. It seemed her ill luck had shot its bolt with the deaths of her first two. Nine lived, and one of them was named Samuel. Jamie elected to follow to sea, though it was not so much a matter of election as compulsion, for the eldest sons on Island McGill remained on the land, while all other sons went to the salt ploughing. Timothy followed Jamie, and by the time the latter had got his first command, a steamer in the bay trade out of Cardiff, Timothy was mate of a big sailing ship. Samuel, however, did not take kindly to the soil. The farmer's life had no attraction for him. His brothers went to sea, not out of desire, but because it was the only way for them to gain their bread. And he, who had no need to go, envied them when, returned from far voyages. They sat by the kitchen fire, and told their bold tales of the wonderlands beyond the sea rim. Samuel became a teacher, much to his father's disgust, and even took extra certificates, going to Belfast for his examinations. When the old master retired, 
Samuel took over his school. Secretly, however, he studied navigation, and it was Margaret's delight when he sat by the kitchen fire, and, despite their master's tickets, tangled up his brothers in the theoretics of their profession. Tom Hennon alone was outraged when Samuel, school teacher, gentleman, and heir to the Hennon farm, shipped to sea before the mast. Margaret had an abiding faith in her son's star, and whatever he did she was sure was for the best. Like everything else connected with his glorious personality, there had never been known so swift a rise as in the case of Samuel. Barely with two years' sea experience before the mast, he was taken from the focusle and made a provisional second mate. This occurred in a fever port on the west coast, and the committee of skippers that examined him agreed that he knew more of the science of navigation than they had remembered or forgotten. Two years later he sailed from Liverpool, mate of the Starry Grace, with both masters and extra masters tickets in his possession. And then it happened he thing the old crones had been shaking their heads over for years. It was told me by Gavin McNabb, bosun of the Starry Grace at the time, himself an island McGill man. Well do I remember ut, he said. We was running our east and down, and mackin' heavy weather of ut. Oz fine a sailor moan Oz ever walked was Samuel Hennon. I remember the look of him well fought last marnin, a watch on them bug seas curlin' up astern, and a watch on the old girl and see you and how she took them he scuppered down below and drin cun for days. It was odd seven thought hen and brought her up on tell the wand, not air until run longer on thought fearful sea. Odd eight, after havin' breakfast, he turns on, and a half hour after up comes the scupper, bleary eyed and shaky and holdin' on tell the companion. It was fair smokin', I am tellin' ye, and there he stood, blinkin' and noddin' and talkin' till humsel. Keep off, says he at last till the moan at the wheel. My God! Says the second mate, standin' beside hum. The scupper never looks till hum at all, but keeps on mutterin' and jabberin' till humsel. All of a sudden like he straightens up and throws his head back, and says, Put your will over, me moan o dam ye. Are ye default ye'll no be here in me? It was a drunken moan's luck, for the starry grace wore off a fourth pot God Almighty gale without shup on a bucket o' water, the second mate shout in orders and the crew jump on like mod. And what thought the scupper nods contented like tell himself and goes below after more whusky. It was plain murder o' the lives o' all of us, for it was no the time for the buggest shup afloat to be runnin'. Run? Never have I seen the like. It was beyond all them cun, and me goon tell sea, boy and men, for forty year. I tell you it was fair awesome. The face o' oh, the second mate was white o's death, and he stood out alone for half an hour, when it was too much for him and he went below and called Samuel and the third. Aye, a fine sailor moan thought Samuel, but it was too much for him. He looked and studied, and looked and studied, but he could no see his way. He durst na heave tell. She would ha been sweep it o' all hands and stucks and ever thung afore she could a fetched up. There was naught tell do but keep on runnin'. And a fud worse and we were lost only way, for soon or late that overtook and sea was sure tell sweep us clear over a poop and all. Did I say it was a God Almighty gale? It was worse nor thought. The devil himself must ha ha a hand and the brew and o' what, it was thought fearsome. I ha looked on some sights, but I am no care till look on the like o' thought again. No moan dared till be on his bunk. No, nor no moan on the decks. All hands of us stood on top the house and held on and watched. The three mates was on the poop, with two men at the wheel, and the only moan below was pot whusky blighted Captain Snorn drunk. And then I see out Coman, a mile away, Risen above all the waves like an island and the sea he buggest wave ever I looked upon. The three mates stood to together and watched up Coman, a prayin' like we thought she would no break unpassion us. But ut was no Toby. Ought the last, when she rose up like a mountain, curlin' above the stern and blottin' out the sky, the mates gathered, the second and third runnin' for the mizzen shrouds and clumbin' up, but the first runnin' till the will to lend a hand. He was a brave man thought Samuel Hennon.
he runs straight until the face o thought father o all waves, no thunkan on himself but thunkan only o the shop. The two men was lashed till the wheel, but he would be ready till Honda the case they was cult. And then she took it. We on the house could no see the poop for the thousand tons o water thought hod hud ut. Thought wave cleaned them out, took everything along with utty two mates, clumbun up the mizzen rug gun, Samuel Hennen run until the wheel, the two men at the wheel, I, and the will itself. We never saw Otto them, for she broached tell what o the will goon, and two men o us was drowned off the house, no tell mentioned the carpenter thought we pucked up at the break o the poop of every bone o hus body broke till he was like so much jelly. And here enters the marvel of it, the miraculous wonder of that woman's heroic spirit. Margaret Hennen was forty-seven when the news came home of the loss of Samuel. And it was not long after that the unbelievable rumor went around Island McGill. I say unbelievable. Island McGill would not believe. Dr. Hall poo-pooed it. Everybody laughed at it as a good joke. They traced back the gossip to Sarah Dack, servant to the Hennens and who alone lived with Margaret and her husband. But Sarah Dack persisted in her assertion and was called a low-mouthed liar. One or two dared question Tom Hennon himself, but beyond black looks and curses for their presumption they elicited nothing from him. The rumor died down, and the island fell to discussing in all its ramifications the loss of the Grenoble in the China Seas, with all her officers and half her crew born and married on Island McGill. But the rumor would not stay down. Sarah Dack was louder in her assertions, the looks Tom Hennen cast about him were blacker than ever, and Dr. Hall, after a visit to the Hennen house, no longer poo-pooed. Then Island McGill sat up, and there was a tremendous wagging of tongues. It was unnatural and ungodly. The like had never been heard. And when, as time passed, the truth of Sarah Dack's utterances was manifest. The island folk decided, like the bosun of the starry grace, that only the devil could have had a hand in so untoward a happening. And the infatuated woman, so Sarah Dack reported, insisted that it would be a boy. Eleven barons high born, she said. Six o them lossies and five o them lotties. And sons there be balance on all thongs, so will there be balance with me. Six o one and half a dozen o the other here as the balance. And Oz sure Oz the sun rises on the marnin, thought sure well up be a boy. And boy it was, and a prodigy. Dr. Hall raved about its unblemished perfection and massive strength, and wrote a brochure on it for the Dublin Medical Society as the most interesting case of the sort in his long career. When Sarah Dack gave the babe's unbelievable weight, Island McGill refused to believe and once again called her liar. But when Dr. Hall attested that he had himself weighed it and seen a tip that very notch, Island McGill held its breath and accepted whatever report Sarah Dack made of the infant's progress or appetite. And once again Margaret Hennen carried a babe to Belfast and had it christened Samuel. Osgood Osgold it was, said Sarah Dack to me. Sarah, at the time I met her, was a buxom, phlegmatic spinster of sixty equipped with an experience so tragic and unusual that though her tongue ran on for decades its output would still be of imperishable interest to her cronies. Osgood Osgood, said Sarah Dack. I'd never fretted. Sut up down on the sun by the hour and never a sound ud would make Oz long Oz ud was no hungered. And thought strong. The grup o ut's hans was like a moans. I mind me, when ud was but hours old. Ut grupped me so mighty thought I fetched a scream I was hot frightened. Ut was the punk o' oh hell. Ut slept and ate, and grew. Ut never bothered. Never a night's sleep Ut lost till no one, nor ever a munuts, and thought what cut in Ut's teeth and all. And Margaret would dandle Ut on her knee and ask was there ever so fine a lottie and the three kingdoms. The way Ut grew. Ut was unkeep on what the way Ut ate. Ought a year it was the size o' a bairn of two. It was slow to walk and talk. Exceptin' for gurgly noises on its throat and for creepin' on all fours, it did na manage much on the walkin' and talkin' line. But thought was to be expected from the way it grew. It all went till growin' strong and healthy. And even old Tom Hennen cheered up at the might of it and said was there ever the like o' it on the three kingdoms. 
at was Dr. Hoth hot first suspicioned, I mind me well, though at was little I dreamt what he was up till at the time. I see him holdin' thunsh in front o' little Sammy's eyes, and a makin' noises, loud and soft, and far and near, on little Sammy's ears. And then I see Dr. Hall go away, runklin' his eyebrows and shackin' his head like the bairn was ailin'. But he was no ailin', as I could swear till, me a see you hum eat and grow. But Dr. Hall no said a word till Margaret and I was no forgetion the why he was sore puzzled. I mind me when little Sammy first spoke. He was two years old and the size of a child o' five, though he could no manage the walkin' yet but went around on all fours, happy and contented like and mackin' no trouble as long as he was fed promptly, which was unusual often. I was hangin' the wash on the line at the time when out he comes, on all fours, his bug head wagged until and fro and blunkin' on the sun. And then, sudden, he talked. I was thought took a back I near died o oh fright, and fine I knew it then, the shackin o oh Dr. Hall's head. Talked. Never a bairn on island McGill talked so loud and tell such purpose. There was no mustic nut. I stood there all tremblin' and shakin. Little Sammy was brain. I tell you, sir, he was brain like an ass us like thought, out and long and cheerful till it seemed his lungs ud crack. He was a idiot great, awful, monster idiot. It was after he talked thought Dr. Hull told Margaret, but she would no believe. It would all come right, she said. It was growlin' too fast for aught else. Gov a time, said she, and we would see. But old Tom Hennon knew, and he never held up his head again. He could no abide the thung, and would no brung him till till touch it. Though I am no dinner and he was fair fascinated by it. Money the time, I see him watch on of ut around a corner, looking at ut till his eyes fair bulge with the horror. And when up braid old Tom ud stuck his fingers till his ears and looked thought miserable I could ape ut at hum. And braid ut could. Ut was the only thung ut could do besides eat and grow. Whenever ut was hungry ut braid, and there was no stop on ut save with food. And always of a marnin. When first Ut crawled till the kitchen door and blunked out at the sun, Ut brayed. And Ut was brain that brought about Ut's end. I mind me well. Ut was three years old and Oz bug Oz a lead o ten. Old Tom H. E. D. been goon from bed to worse, pluffin' up and down the fields and talkin' and mutter until himself. On the marnin' o' the day I mind me, he was sudden on the bench outside the kitchen, a footin' the handle till a puck axe. Unbeknown. The monster idiot crawled till the door and brayed after his fashion at the sun. I see old Tom start up and look. And there was the monster idiot, wagon up's bug head and blunkin and brain like the great bug ass it was. It was too much for Tom. So Methan went wrong with him sudden like. He jumped till his feet and fetched the puck handle down on the monster idiot's head. And he had ut again and again like ut was a mud dog and hum a feared o ut. And he went straight till the stable and hung him so till a rafter. And I was no for stoppin' on after such like, and I went till stay along with me suster thought was married till John Martin and comfortable off. I sat on the bench by the kitchen door and regarded Margaret Hennon, while with her callous thumb she pressed down the live fire of her pipe and gazed out across the twilight's sombered fields. It was the very bench Tom Hennon had sat upon that last sanguinary day of life. And Margaret sat in the doorway where the monster, blinking at the sun, had so often wagged its head and brayed. We had been talking for an hour, she with that slow certitude of eternity that so befitted her. And, for the life of me, I could lay no finger on the motives that ran through the tangled warp and woof of her. Was she a martyr to truth? Did she have it in her to worship at so abstract a shrine? Had she conceived abstract truth to be the one high goal of human endeavor on that day of long ago when she named her first-born Samuel? Or was hers the stubborn obstinacy of the ox? The fixity of purpose of the balky horse? The stolidity of the self-willed peasant mind? Was it whim or fancy? He won streak of lunacy in what was otherwise an eminently rational mind? Or, reverting, was hers the spirit of a Bruno? 
Was she convinced of the intellectual rightness of the stand she had taken? Was hers a steady, enlightened opposition to superstition? Or India Sutler thought as she mastered by some vaster, profounder superstition, a fetish worship of which the Alpha and the Omega was the cryptic Samuel? Well ye be telling me, she said, thought of the second Samuel had been named Larry thought he would know how fell in the hot water and drowned it. Atween you and me, sir, and ye are untelugin look until the eye, would the name have made that only ways different? Would the wash and no be done thought day if he had been Larry or Michael? Would hot water no be hot, and would hot water no burn if he had had any other name but Samuel? I acknowledge the justice of her contention, and she went on. Do a wee bud of a name change the plans o oh God? Do the world run by hut or muss, and be God a weak, shully shallion creature thought I'd alter the fate and destiny o oh thungs because the worm Margaret Hennen seen foot tell name her Baron Samuel? There be my son Jimmy. He will no sign a Russian fun on his crew because o oh believe in thought Russian funds do be monogin the ones and have the mackin o bod weather. Well you be the cun so? Well you be the cun pot god pot makes the ones tell blow will bend his head from on high tell us and tell the word o oh, a greasy Russian fun on some dirty shops folks'll? I said no, certainly not. But she was not to be set aside from pressing home the point of her argument. Then while you be the Kunpot God thought directs the stars on their courses, and tell whose mighty foot the world is but a footstool, while you be the Kunpot he will take a spite again Margaret Hennen and send a bug wave off the cape to wash her son until eternity, all because she was for Nam and Hum Samuel, but why Samuel? I asked. And thought I didna know. I wanted it so. But why did ye want it so? And us of me thought would be answer on a such like question? Be there only moan Leuven or dead pot can answer? Who can tell the why o like? My Jamie was fair daft on buttermilk, he would drunk up till, as he said himself, his back teeth was a wash. But my Tumothy could no abide buttermilk. I liked to listen till the thunder growlin' and roarin', and rampagin'. My Katie could no abide the noise of ut but must scream and flutter and go runnin' for the mud most o a feather bed. Never yet have I heard the answer tell the why o like, God alone has thought answer. You and me be mortal and we canna know. Enough for us tell know what we like and what we do like. I like hot as the first word and last. And behind thought like no men can go and find the why o what. I like Samuel, and I like ut well. Ut as a sweet name. And there be a rollin' wonder on the sound o' oh, a thought passes understandin'. The twilight deepened, and in the silence I gazed upon that splendid dome of a forehead which time could not mar, at the width between the eyes, and at the eyes themselves leer, outlooking, and wide seeing. She rose to her feet with an air of dismissing me, saying, It will be a dark walk home, and there will be more thon a sprung o' wet on the sky. Have you any regrets? Margaret Hennen? I asked, suddenly and without forethought. She studied me a moment. I thought I know how born another son. And you would. I faltered. I thought I would, she answered. It would have been his name. I went down the dark road between the hawthorn hedges puzzling over the wide like, repeating Samuel to myself in a loud and listening to the rolling wonder in its sound that had charmed, 